Hey, Link Frequencies are open. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sam DeLev's birthday, our Star Trek Adventures live play here on Q Times. Uh, we're going to be getting into our Sam DeLev's birthday today. Um, but before we get into Sam DeLev's birthday today, we're going to see if we have any announcements today. Um, I'm going to just check my notes here. Oh, I think there's a big announcement. Um, I have here that in my notes, it's actually Sam DeLev's birthday. Oh, no, that wasn't it. That was no, also, it? Uh, that wasn't my announcement either. Oh, okay. So I'm. Uh, why don't Why don't you guys do your announcements first, and then I'll get to Sam Deleve's birthday. Okay. Um, it's Sam Deleve's birthday. Uh, <laughs> oh, um, I had that in my notes too. Oh right. shoot! Uh, I have more announcements, but yeah. maybe other people should do theirs first before we get into those. Sure thing. Uh, my announcement is that uh, it's Sam Deleve's birthday. Oh, it's Sam Deleve's birthday. And I, I do have other things that I need to talk about, but I want to make sure that um, uh, yeah, everybody has their opportunity. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Thank you for reminding us. We need to put that down. Yes, Ravity. Um, I uh, just think that we should all know that it's a uh, Sam the Love's birthday. Mm. Uh, mm. Don't know. I know it. Really. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I know. something. Time for it. Also, like before we go any further, I just wanted mm -hmm. to say happy birthday, Sam. <laughs> Is oh, it Sam's God. birthday? Oh, my God. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you. Oh Happy birthday, God. Sam. Happy birthday, Sam. Oh, my I God. We broke Sam. <laughs> I wish I, I mean, had known. isn't that essentially the um, the goal of any time it manages Everything. to land on? Because, like, yeah. I believe this is now the second time we've managed to have a show land on Sam's birthday. Um, we plan it. We plan it that way. Yep. yep. We pick our daily show every year. We're like, okay, so we're going to do it on Monday nights. Looking through the calendar, Sam, oh, Sam's okay. birthday. Make sure, let's make sure that we got something going on on Halloween and Sam's birthday. Next year, it'll be on a Sunday. So we'll have to make sure to do, I, I don't know what date it will be on. It would probably on the, Maybe yeah, it doesn't so. matter. Anyways, <laughs> I think it would be the Tuesday. It's usually yeah. the, the next day in the calendar year. But I'm pretty sure the library bards uh, have announcements to make because they usually do. Yeah, fire away. Actually, I have a pretty big one. Uh, okay. Starting this Wednesday, which is in two days, uh, right here on Q Times, Denver by Night is returning for a second Ooh. season. So if you want to see some wacky ladies of the undead with fangs do things, hey, what a, all right. That's the best advertisement for Vampire the Masquerade. So if you want to see some wacky ladies with some fangs. Do some things. That's lose our humanity to the beast. Come on down to Q times. Hey, come on yeah. down to Q times, right here, right now. Wednesdays, five, seven thirty. Hey, when, when is it? Uh, Wednesdays, five thirty to seven thirty on Q times. Denver by right. night, and then um, on Saturdays, I'm on Things in Space, the Starfinder. I'm now a permanent guest member for my one episode guest appearance. Great overlay <laughs> in that game, by the way. It looks really good. Oh yeah, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. What you got, Sander? I know you got something. Oh, uh, not and nothing this week, but I do have the game that I ran for GaryCon with right. Bonnie in it. Yeah. Uh, so you can see that I believe VOD is on Twitch uh, oh. TV slash GaryCon, and it might be up on their YouTube channel soon. <laughs> and there was one I did on Sunday that was that was a lot of fun too, and it was so funny. <laughs> which which who what stream punks were in your game, Xander? It was Aki and Bonnie from Stream Punks. Okay, and then what was the other one? What it was the other game? What was the other game? For yeah. Sunday that for, I did? For Sunday? Yeah. Oh, it, there was sadly no other stream punks in it. It was me and a bunch of uh, a bunch of old fellas. <laughs> but Sam, it was great. But, but Sam, you know what was in it? Kyle Vogt was in it. Uh, what, was it? Uh, Sam, Sam and I did uh, a Darkened Wish cast together. Oh, nice. Oh, right. Wait, Sam DeLev? The oh. person whose birthday it is today, is yes. It, it's, it's their birthday it's their today, birthday isn't it? Today. Yeah. I brought my face back to a normal color. Which means okay. that we have clearly fa failed in mentioning uh, at a steady pace that it's your yeah. birthday in order to keep you from being able to yeah. have a normal face. That's, that's, Damn. we failed. We, we, we oh. have to stop the stream now. Uh, I don't think we can so go any further than this. Sam's guys tonight, everybody. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but speaking, yeah, speaking of announcements, yeah. Um, finale of It Came From The Loop is this week. Uh, and I'm mad and, and upset because I want to play with this cast forever and it's just not fair. Um, it, it's really just not fair. Um, but uh, please come and join us over on Rule of Lore for the finale of It Came From The Loop um, at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and then of course, in case you missed it, I am now part of a Four episode a world of the apocalypse game over on uh mythic grove uh i am playing calliope saunders um 
the uh, lupus from uh, the red talons and um, they're only 16 and somehow still managed to uh, become party parent. I don't know how this happened. Um, You're a red talon. <laughs> that is so metal. I, I am. I am a red talon. We're going to see how that goes. Um, and uh, and uh, let's see. Um, I also have, I think, several things coming up through Indicade that I haven't completely confirmed or nailed down, but I will have hopefully indicated announcements coming up here soon. And um, I have like another special thing that might be coming up on Halloween that I will announce soon. And then I also have Roll20 Clon on the 23rd. Okay. Pathfinder. I'm in a lot of one shots and stuff yeah. this Maybe month. You should just post a link to a bunch of the stuff. Yeah, just like saying. watch That's my socials because I'm in yeah. I'm I'm in a lot of things and I don't exactly know when all like yeah, social media. That's a thing that is convenient for everybody. Cool beans. Okay. Anybody else got stuff coming up that they'd like to announce or anything they've got going on? I think it's Sam's birthday. Yeah, Is it I'm Sam's pretty birthday? sure it's birthday. All right, cool. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's Sam's birthday. Which I think um, means that we don't allow them to do the thing because if my memory serves last time we did it and so therefore we can't let them do it this time either. So I believe that it is about time to start Clear Skies and we are all Excited. Excited. Um, uh, let's go ahead and jump into tonight's episode of Sam Skies. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, just be, I didn't get a chance to announce it before we jump to our credits, but I did want to let you all know that, uh, <laughs> look at Sam bracing for impact. <laughs> I was just going to let you know to confirm we do not have a Gina DeVivo tonight. Um, Gina is taking the night off, so we will catch up with them next Monday night. Um, so we will try not to break things while they are gone. Maybe she will come back to a ship that's intact. We will see. Um, maybe try. The, try. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into tonight's uh, game of it's Sam's birth. It's clear skies. Um, when we last left off, the crew of the USS Ross was getting some much needed downtime after some pretty perilous missions across the galaxy, specifically ranging from the Shackleton Expanse to on the other side of Romulan territory and back. After having completed these dangerous missions, the Ross has begun to build a bit of a name for herself. She has docked back at home base, Narendra Station, Starbase 364. The Ox crew has mingled once again with family and friends that they have not seen in months now. And a refit has begun to commence on the USS Ross. She is being upgraded. If y'all remember correctly, Admiral April Eber informed Captain Sull and Commander Exio, that the Ross, in order to better suit the exploration profile in which she is now going to be engaging in here in the Shackleton Expanse, will be upgraded with high resolution sensors, which are typically only reserved for the most advanced science vessels in the fleet. Specifically, right now, they are the standard found on board the Intrepid class starship. 
It's very unusual to see them outside of Sovereign and Intrepid class starships. But the Ross being a unique case and also being a unique design, the upgrade is going to take some finessing. So flying all the way out here to the other side of the quadrant is none other than the ship designer himself, Dr. Dubloch Moroni, the Tellarite, who is very excited to once again work side by side. Well, I shouldn't say work, but be side by side with a very enthusiastic Bolian engineer that he met before he left. Um, you know, just from word of mouth spreading around at the party uh, tech that this Tellarite is extremely happy that you took his advice and didn't blow the ship up. Mm. Um, and that you have actually managed to contain the extraordinary amounts of plasma, con the, the power flowing to the plasma conduits throughout the entirety of the Ross, having, you know, two warp cores. <laughs> um, but that's not all that's happening in the background. Because impending meeting with Ambassador Pagino is looming over the head of our ambassador. Uh, the Pagino has been looking forward to calling in favor, perhaps. You don't know exactly what is going to be transpiring in this meeting. Pagino, being a very difficult Romulan to read, even for a Romulan, has portrayed himself as very much sort of the affable, reasonable, insightful Romulan. But the things you've learned about him over time would suggest that this is a wolf in sheep's clothing, which has kind of made everyone a little on edge. What doesn't help the situation is right when you feel like you've just stepped away from intrigue, the Klingon ambassador is trying to drag you into a little bit more. He's calling in a favor and asking for help, trying to uncover evidence of the activities of General Cargan, which he can't technically do because it would be a little difficult for the Klingon ambassador to move around unseen, as it were. So he's using his diplomatic channels to see if maybe he can learn anything. If it's to gain access to a database, if it's just to observe activity, whatever he can do. He doesn't seem to have a specific agenda. He's literally just asking for help. And he did inform you that there is a Klingon warship that is currently on station right now that's being framed and set up to take a fall. One of his bright and up-and-coming commanders is currently on the brink of destruction. If she is recalled to Narendra Station, it could be disastrous for the crew of the IKS Borku. And right now, this Klingon vessel is on the edge of Romulan Federation space, buying time. And Jal needs your help. Other things going on around the ship, of course, are a few of the crew members sort of getting in touch with each other again, reconnecting on a personal level, and actually beginning to let their hair down, as it were, um, in that everyone is finally able to exhale after this whole incident with the Romulans and everything. From, from the moment you guys encountered the particle fountain ages ago, it has been nonstop. <laughs> from the crystalline entity being born to the Tholian threat, to uncovering this new life like that's out here in the Shackleton Expanse and the mysterious wave that Dr. Yada discovered, to the things that have been going on internally inside the Ross, trying to figure out what's up with Exio, the conflicting information that she's been getting, the shenanigans with the time travelers that were appearing on board the Ross, but that temporal investigations and in present day Starfleet has shut down completely and said, thank you, we'll take it from here. Please turn over all files and data that you had on this. <laughs> and that was that. Um, it has been nonstop. And after last night's party, even after sort of the joyous events that have taken place of everyone being able to unwind and eat really good food prepared for by a very meticulous, very passionate bullion, the morning after when everyone is waking up, to the realization that for the next two days, no one has any activities listed on their duty roster. Right now, the USS Ross is currently in a two-day reprieve as engineering teams are setting up for the refit. Right now, it's basic stuff. 
checking in with your department heads, checking in with your workspaces, making sure that everything is in order, organizing as needed, leave things out of the way so that if the engineers need to move through here, they can do so without tripping over your stuff. The Ross is essentially being tucked away the way somebody might if a parent is about to come on board, almost like it would be for the Admiral's inspection. But instead, for the next week, the Ross is going to be pretty much offline as she is being refitted with these high resolution sensors, which as a quick reminder tech is going to be a bit of a balancing act specifically because a lot of the energy that is being tied into these uh, sensors, the long range sensor control is on deck 14, but it's pulling a lot of power through these plasma conduits. And it means that there's going to have to be some modification to the main phaser array. It will not affect the phasers in any way. It's mm-hmm. literally it's literally a process of <laughs> making room for new equipment. The Ross being an experimental class NX starship is packed with technologies. So much so that it causes her to occasionally break down. <laughs> it's got a good engineering team that's prevented that to happen on the regular, but she does have a trait on her character sheet that I can spin threat for that will make your lives very difficult because of how much technology is loaded up on this platform of a starship. So you did notice that. (laughs) Oh yeah. (laughs) And incorporating in these high resolution sensors is taking a lot of rewiring and moving things into new positions. Essentially her innards are being shifted around a little bit to make room for these new sensors as the old ones are being replaced. So it's a delicate process. You are going to have advantage on this, though, because you do have the ship lead ship designer is going to be assisting you. Yes. Um, You also know, too, I should tell you that um, this is going to mean that sporadically throughout the week, the transporters are going to be offline. So there will be no using the transporter. It'll be shuttles only if you've got to come and go on the USS Ross. Ensign Dari, by mm-hmm. the way, is ecstatic. Oh, good. She has been wanting to crawl into the guts of the Ross and give like a hardware update for ages. This is like the dream. Because Ensign Dari, even though you know Ensign Dari has a deep love for deep space assignments, the way the Ross operates, she has told you now in personal conversation that her grand dream is to be a ship designer. Mm-hmm. She wants to work at Utopia Planitia Shipyards. She wants, to, she wants to be one of the next lead ship designers on one of the next class starships. And being able to crawl around inside the Ross like this, an experimental class starship is the dream. So we start the morning off with you arriving in main engineering. Hmm. Incendari, uncharacteristically, is already there. Oh, and not as you, only on time, but early. As you approach, she slides a steaming hot cup of coffee across what looks like, well, you know, the, the main countertop here, the main like engineering platform slides mm-hmm. it over to you and says, sir. I pull out a tricorder and I just say, who are you? And what have you done with Ensendari? I'm gonna do you a favor today, sir. Uh-huh. Now I really don't believe you. I would really, really appreciate the opportunity to run interference for you uh, anytime you want to get away from Dr. Maroney, sir. Go on. Well, it's, um, I've been wanting to bend his ear for a while now. I mean, he does, he was the lead designer on the Ross. This is, this is an opportunity to kind of learn what I can from him. And there is, I, I, I've, I've dealt with Della Tellarites before. I've studied his work. I, I read the manuals. I, I know everything that he did for the USS Ross, the genius design. I mean, replacing the saucer section from the old designs, incorporating in, uh, an amalgam of, of of the sovereign class and the galaxy class. It just, I, I have a lot of questions and wow. I know you're going to want to be hands-on. And I thought if there's ever a moment where you want him to, you know, um, piss off, I could be the one that jumps in and helps you out, sir. So you've acknowledged the, the genius of Dr. Maroney and yet you think you're good enough to get some time with him? Oh yeah. Oh, good. You're going to need that kind of confidence when you talk to a Tellarite. So it's just kind of testing you there. You're good to go. There's a beat where you see a flash of doubt <laughs> after you crack that joke. And she goes, <laughs> great. Thank you, sir. 
Enjoy your coffee. Don't let him see you slip. She nods as she kind of skips around the corner. Coffee's quite good. Mm-hmm. As you sip it, you're like, you're pretty sure this came all the way down from 10 forward. Wow, someone's yeah. looking to impress. Stolen probably <laughs> made this cup of coffee. As <laughs> you're sitting like, yep, yep, she's in full ass kiss mode. <laughs> I'm going to make a note on her record uh, <laughs> and specifically towards uh, maybe a career in shipbuilding. Okay. And notify, uh, yeah, just put it, put it in her file. We are going to cut to the fuzzy image that LaCat sees as her eyes slowly open. And across from her on her bed, you see the and hear the gentle snores of a passed out Andorian in full dress uniform laying on his stomach um, just about a foot and a half away from your face. He's laying just face down, like off to the side. His hair is just, I mean, he always had kind of messy hair, but it's at the point now where like, you can only see one of his antenna peeking out of the white fluff that's kind of like mangled on the top of his head. And he, (laughs) he looks like he's probably still in the middle of REM sleep. He is just out like cat. He is just, I'm gonna roll to see if she, what exactly she does in this moment because okay. two things. Um, Let chaos decide. Yeah, she is. Uh, she 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 sees this, and then it's the her staring at the ceiling for a moment. In wide, what the fuck do I do? Um, great. So she's not gonna kick him out of the bed. <laughs> um, this is good. I think that she is going to slowly roll out of bed. Okay. And then stand there. Realize she's still in her dress. He still has, has his shoes on. on. Yeah. <laughs> His, his, dress, and the whole thing feels like an acid dream. <laughs> And then she's going to look for her calm slowly. Your calm is over by a, what looks like to be a bottle of empty Andorian wine that you don't remember coming back to your quarters with. Uh, but apparently that was also finished. There's only one glass. So somebody either had the bottle in a glass or somebody, or you guys were sharing, you don't know. <laughs> but um, you walk over to your calm is just sitting there. Um. This is so stupid. She's going to take the glasses so that she can do an analysis on them to see exactly who drank what. Because she's trying to reconstruct as much of last night as she can. You right blood a tricorder? Hey, this is a great way to ro- to gain momentum for the start yeah. of the game. So make a reason science check, difficulty zero, as you scan the bottle and the, and the wine glass. Um, this is great. This is great. I got two successes. Uh, your DNA is all over the lip of the bottle, and his is all over the lip of the wine glass. Okay, great. This is good. This is, this, this is great. Um, anyway. Uh... She she kind of just sighs deeply, like, and like she's trying to remember the conversation she had. But she picks up her calm, beeps it on, and um, Jane to Olin. So when you beep your calm, yeah, it clearly triggers something in the Star Trek in the Starfleet officer that is laying in your bed. Because he no. immediately wakes up at the sound of a calm going off. <laughs> this Andorian sits up and goes, what? Um, when you hear Jane to Olin, you hear in the background, what? Olin. <laughs> um, oh, God. Um, move the cover. <laughs> Jane? Uh, Jane is going to try and sl- like <laughs> slip into a hallway so he doesn't see her. Yeah, he watches you slip into this hallway. Like, you round the corner and goes... Can I roll for stealth? No, he looks right at you. That's not going to be a roll. <laughs> he sits bolt upright in bed. I'll spin thread if I have to. He sits <laughs> bolt upright and sees you slip around the corner. And you hear the questioning of Ambassador Olin on your communicator. And a beat. And around the corner, you hear the voice of Ren go, Jane, what are you doing in my quarters? Wait, aren't these my quarters? 
Yes. Jane, what what is going on? They are here quarter. Oh, shit. Uh are you where where are you right now? I'm on the Ross. I'm in, in your my bed, quarters? I guess. I thought this was my quarters. Oh what? my god. Did we finish that? Did oh we, my god, did we finish what? that? No, I think I think my DNA is on the bottle and yours is on the glass. I hate I, you probably finished that. I probably finished that. That was probably me. Um, oh, my God. On, I'm, can, can you send me your location? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in I'm, the living room. No, I'm, I'm in, in my quarters. You're in your bed, Bren. You're in your bed. What? I, this is your room. I don't have... No, my room. Right. Damn it. You're you're in my bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? Wait a minute. Hold on. Yes, I am. <laughs> and then, like... A bolt of lightning. It strikes her. The last thing they said before, like they fell asleep. Um, and Jane says, oh, "Olin, send me your location. I am uh, coming to you asap." I'm in my quarters on the Ross. Be right there. Great. Click. Okay. So Jane is now going to um like if if you're cool with me eric i'd like to like have like a little like memory for jane real quick right as she remembers you want to take control of the narrative go ahead no, yeah just, just just real quick tell me, tell me what happened last night tell me, okay, tell me I'll tell you what happened last night i think it was a pretty like it was a pretty nor like like to clear up any any uh yep. things that might get written yep 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 <laughs> it was a pretty normal night um, they got back to the room, but I think that as they were falling asleep, but also through the haze of her drunkenness, this is what Jane is remembering, and it kind of like floats in front of her memory and 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 like to the forefront of her mind. And she's trying to remember if this is just a drunken remembrance or if it actually happened. And she's about to try and ask Ren if it's the truth or not. But she remembers the last thing she said before she went to bed is when Ren said. She wished Ren good night. She said good night, Silas, and he said good night, Jane. And the last thing she remembers is telling him, "My name's not Jane." Ah, yes, that's right. So I remember you said that. And then she flaks out, goes to sleep. Mm -hmm. Uh, so she's curious if Ren remembers, but this is really actually boosting her confidence. The way that he is acting in this very moment is great. Um, and 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 tradition. Uh, yes. In, in tradition, he looks at you with a mild concern on his face and completely deadpan says the magical words, I think I lost a pip. Oh, God. I don't, I don't see it. I'm supposed, yeah. to have, I'm supposed to have two. I think I lost one. What? I mean, here, you can have mine for right now. I just need to go. Okay. <laughs> I yeah, just thank you. You can keep looking. I just, I got a, I got, last night was great. Okay. Now she's going to beeline out of there on that awkward comment. Um, <laughs> okay. She'd like to go to Olin's. This, this is my birthday present. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like before, it's a pip show. <laughs> <laughs> so Jane, one pip less uh, because she really wanted to escape that situation and would do anything. Uh, to do so is now uh, barreling towards uh, Olin's uh, quarters on the Ross. In full, she's still in her dress. This is the worst walk of shame ever. <laughs> okay. So you're arriving at Olin's quarters. There's a chirping sound just outside your quarters, Olin, as you were anticipating there to be. Enter. Um... Jane enters and doesn't say anything. Uh, just, just walks in. Moment, hey, goes and sits on your couch. <laughs> um, so Olin goes and makes a hot cup of tea, <laughs> couple of cups of tea. Okay. Perfect. Um. It so, is worth noting, Jane, it, it, you, you being in the ambassador's quarters, mm -hmm. it is a quick reminder that the ambassador has 
beautiful quarters. This is on the side of the ship that you can actually overlook Narendra Station and see all of the ships coming and going, the civilian vessels coming and going here at Starbase 364. Um, it's it's quite lovely. And you can even see a bit of that ambient glow coming off the hull of the Ross. It's also quite spacious. Olin sets down the cup of tea in front of the cat and then sits down on the couch next to them and is just quiet. So last night was fun. How was your day? Ambassador Joel is lovely. He reminds me a lot of uh, my father, actually. If you ever get the chance to get to know him, I think you might agree. Got kind of the same air about them. They are both intense. In a good way. Or at least from what I've heard of Joel. That's good to hear. Also, if you ever get the chance to dance with Exio, you absolutely need to take the opportunity. She is amazing. <laughs> did she lift you? She did. Oh my god. It's okay. like that movie you saw you 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 showed me once. Dirty Dancing? Yes, that one. Great. That was gonna be my second guess. I'm really glad I went for my friend that I went for it instead. Oh my god. Um first one was Titanic. Uh, speaking, speaking we, are, of, we, are, uh, we are artifacts of our time. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, though. Was that Brian? Oh, no, deflecting. We're not talking about my night at all. <laughs> I just need to right. get out of a situation. Okay, How we'll talk about everything else, then. Do things seem tense between the Klingons and the Romulans still? Funny you should mention that. I'm very good at deflecting. <laughs> I know that you are, and I'm going to let you do it. And we can have that conversation when you're ready to. And there's another conversation I think that you and I are going to have to have pretty soon as well. That will also happen when you're ready for it, too. Is this the sex talk? Time out. <laughs> I think they're well. So when that Cardassian and then Dorian like each other, an ambassador and like and, and a Cardassian and a and a and a and a, uh, a Bajoran like each other as well. Apparently, oh we'll not have gonna... that conversation later. Oh boy. Um. Anyway, I'm very glad at deflecting. So here we are. I am afraid that. There's something I need to have a conversation with the captain about. And I have a feeling that you'll likely get brought in on it. Because you're smart. And you're very clever. And you have the and you have the brain. Don't don't do this. I, we've known each other for years. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um but it is a a little bit of a conundrum. How so? Well, it puts us firmly right back in the place I was hoping we'd left behind, but I don't think I'm the only person who hoped that, too. Jane leans in close. Are you telling me the USS Ross is not an exploration vessel? Maybe <laughs> one day we will be. Oh, gods, maybe one day. I hate that you're in the midst of this, but... If anyone's gonna do it, you're probably the best at it. I don't trust half. And then she like stops. Cause she, it sounds like she was gonna say, I don't trust half the people in Starfleet to do their jobs, but uh, she she stops. Uh, okay. And uh, drinks her tea, sips <laughs> <laughs> her tea um, instead and uh, tries to get her this hangover. Um, we haven't talked much about what happened when you guys went to Nimbus 3. No. No, we didn't. Um, everything just kind of approached real fast. I mean, it was fine. McCrell was brilliant. Uh, of course she was. was. Mm -hmm. And so was the captain. The captain can act. <laughs> There was there was a lot of acting. Um, but... well, it 
was their expertise for quite some time. It essentially still is. Right. Do you ever wonder what it would take to get you to leave behind the life of intelligence? Because I think about that every single time I see the captain. Maybe eventually you get tired of living a lie. Uh, yeah, um, I'm very glad to have you on the ship, and I want you to know that you are one of the most important people to me. Thank you for this, team. Do you have any idea how thrilled I was when I heard that you had been assigned to the Ross, and that you and I were going to get to serve together? I mean, I am pretty cool. <laughs> Um, she's you a, are, but I mean, consider the chances that yeah. of all of the missions, of all of the things that you and I could have been assigned to, we actually got to do something together. I mean, that's pretty incredible. I mean, we're still doing something together, and hopefully, we'll get out to the Shackleton real soon and carve new paths, right? I really hope that eventually, at some point, you and I get to do a mission together. Because we haven't done one yet. We have not done one yet. All you have to do is solve the tensions between the Romulan and the Klingon empires first, and then we'll get to it. But you know what? <sighs> that should be easy for you. But easy. Jane seems like she's in a considerably more, she's in a better mood now. Um, you want some breakfast to go with that tea? No. Or soak I up a little bit of the alcohol? I should get out of this. I'm still... Actually, can I borrow some of your clothes so I don't have to walk back to my quarters in this? Sure. It looks really good on you, though, mm -hmm. that being said. Your Thanks. mother would be... Your mother would be proud. Thanks. Um... I mean, yeah, I'm here because of her, so. She did a damn good job. Where are those clothes? This way. Great. Every now and again, Olin likes to push just slightly past And it's Jane's very special. good. It's good that you do, because every, every time, Jane gives a little bit more. Um, and so here we are. She... She goes and changes her clothes, and uh, I'm good to call that a scene. Um, at that point, coming into sick bay, I mean, at, again, right now the Ross is at like running on low power, so it almost looks like the night shift in the main corridors of the USS Ross. Only the necessary departments are well lit at the moment, as most of the crew is disembarked onto Narendra Station or is coming and going. Um, there is sort of the, again, there's there's a trade-off with like which transporters are working. So when one transporter room is functioning, the other transporter rooms are down. Um, it limits how many people are coming and going. And it also kind of gives the USS Ross this feeling of a bit of a ghost town. Um, Captain Soul, as you're waking up in your quarters here on the Ross, it's very quiet. Not even the standard hum of the engine as she is currently in station keeping and docked. And with so many people off the vessel, as Kirk once said, the Ross is starting to feel like a house with all the children gone. Oh. It's fine. <laughs> We're supposed to get out from under the feet of the engineering team, which I understand also means me. So I need to cut to just the very closest shot of me putting on all four of my pips. Okay. Cool, thank you. Uh, now we proceed and I go about my day. Going onto the bridge to make sure that everything is in ship shape, you notice the only person on the bridge is Asmi Shanto, who is standing a few feet in front of the captain's chair in full uniform and going through data pads. And when she spots you, she stiffens and says, Captain on the Brit." Oh. <laughs> yeah. Good, good morning, Captain. Morning. What have we got? Not a lot on your docket today. And hands you one of the data pads. And she says, everyone's pretty much 
sleeping off last night. Ox crew, Solon threw the Ox crew a bit of a party last night in honor of uh, everything that's happened. So many people couldn't fit in one place for the celebration on Starbase, so Ox Overflow crew only seems reasonable, absolutely. That being said, uh, Ox crew is also seeing to the cleanup of the promenade level right now, Captain. I'm glad to hear. How bad was the damage? Oh, um, thankfully it was all holographic, so nothing too spectacular. Thanks, stars, for small mercies. And she nods and says, <laughs> um, <sighs> Dr. Deblutch has to Blush Maroney has been, has been asking for a lot of time from both you and Chief Tech. I've been managed to run interference on your behalf, letting him know that you have a pretty full schedule, but... But apparently I don't. I don't. So I should be here with my ship. Do I understand if, you correctly, Yeoman? If that's what you want, Captain, I can see Perfect. to it. Good. I'll... Let Dr. Maroney know you're available. Excellent. Never let it be said you are not a courageous captain. What was that? She puts the data pad up to her chest and leans forward and says, never let it be said that you're not a courageous captain, sir. And you, a courageous yeoman. Anything else? No, sir. That's it for today, but I'll be available at your convenience if you need me for anything. Wonderful. Calms me when something inevitably comes up. Uh, other than that, I suppose, if someone needs to find me, I'll be up in, to my arms in main engineering with the chief. The holodeck is completely free, sir. Are you suggesting recreation? Captain, I have full access to your daily schedule. You haven't taken any time off in a long time, sir. You know, it's a very good point. Main engineering. Aye, Captain. And with a small smile, like a surrender, she dips her head and heads to the turbo lift. A few moments later- And I take later, my hypocritical notions about Work-life balance down to main engineering. Okay. She, as she departs through the main turbo lift, <clears throat> before you step onto your turbo lift off to the side, you have a moment, Captain, where the bridge is yours. There's no one else here. Just the steady hum of the computers constantly running through their maintenance cycles. The passive scans that are always active when the Ross is powered up. The empty chairs, not even Exios here. You can see the tactical station where Prawl is normally seated. You remember what it was like when you left Space Dock those months ago, heading out to the Shackleton Expanse. For this brief moment, this empty space where these people who show up every day on every shift to do what they do. I pause for a moment. I turn back and walk right up to that spot in the gap between the science and the helm station. Mm -hmm. And I kneel down and I put my head against the console and whisper her, thank you for taking care of them. I kiss her. I get on the turbo lift. All right. <clears throat> There's a message waiting for you, Dr. McCrell, on your computer. As you're starting to clean out some unnecessary files and reorganize your desk before you leave main sick bay, because you're not going to be needed here for a spell, you see a transmission coming in from Starfleet Command. It's actually labeled Federation Medical Council. I open it, obviously. Oh, yes. first, I have some tea made. Sure. We all were very big tea and coffee drinkers on the ship. <laughs> You're um, actually experiencing the same thing the captain's experience, where you have an empty sick bay, no nurses, I no know. doctors. I empty. might go to the holodeck. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um. Uh, so I'm just gonna sit with my tea and and open up the message. Okay. A woman's face appears. Uh, looks like she's young, maybe in her mid twenties, early twenties. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you recognize her immediately as being one of the youngest doctors in Starfleet. This is Dr. Maple Hernandez of the Federation Medical Council. And when her face appears, it's obvious this is a pre-recorded message. This big beaming smile. Um, Latino descent, her hair is pulled back in a beautifully well-made bun to the back of her head. And she is wearing the high collar doctor's coat. Underneath, you can see the blue, the blues of a Starfleet uniform. You actually are starting to see, this is one of the newer uh, Starfleet uniforms that is currently being uh, worn at Starfleet Command. It's very nice. Um, her big smile, there's a beat. And then she, when she sees the message is now recording, she says, Dr. McCrell, uh, my name is Dr. Maple Hernandez, and it's a pleasure to send you this message. Um, I will be your liaison to the Federation Medical Council regarding your nomination for the Carrington Award. Oh, yes, that. Um, <laughs> I said that to myself. You, <laughs> yeah. If you have any questions or if you would like to know anything, please, I am the person to contact. Um, we're so excited to be able to uh, put you up for consideration for this award, Doctor. I hope you realize, of course, that just being considered for the Carrington Award is quite an honor and is remembered uh, to be, it, it is something of a prestigious event. Yes. I did want to give you a heads up that as per usual, um, we will be conducting uh, what would be considered sort of um, a, a survey of your career and your personnel files. Um, I wanted to let you know so there wasn't any alarm. This is a very standard procedure. It happens to everybody who's nominated for the awards. And any accolades are presented at the awards ceremony. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a heads up with that. If there's nothing else, if you don't need anything else, please uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime you need. Um, but in the meantime, thank you so much. And congratulations on your nomination, Doctor. Dr. Hernandez out. And it cuts out. I just said, I'm like, yes, that's what they all say. It's an honor just to be nominated. And it is. And, and I'm just looking around and there's no one here. <laughs> okay. Yes. And I'm just kind of. All right. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> You're just like. Uh, I, I was actually going to uh, send a message to okay. Dr. Neary on the um nander station the klingon doctor mm -hmm. that i that i that nearly fought with made <laughs> the last with. time i made friends with what no climbing um and i just I was actually suggesting violence but i mean i guess that could go either way with oh the... sure oh that too <laughs> no climbing no fighting uh, it's uh her, name, her I, name is uh, commander nira Nira. i thought it was neary it's ah. in apostrophe r-i-a well, She's the chief I, my notes were wrong. Noria. Noria. Um, I would. I was just gonna send a courtesy message to let her know that, like, hey, I'm in town. I'm in your neighborhood. What's up? Uh, to see if 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 they wanted to um meet up and talk doctor things. See how <laughs> how boring things still are on the station. Um, since that was her main complaint last time. Okay. Uh, just you know. To catch up, you know, to talk doctor things with. You basically send a message, Generic texting message. it, send it, send it to her. Mm -hmm. And after the message is sent, you lean back in your chair. And again, the quiet, the mild hum of a ship that is not currently being powered by her main warp course, instead is just running on silent. You can hear the chirping of the computers as they are running through their standard diagnostic cycles, same as the bridge. But for the most part, that steady ambient hum that everyone gets used to living on board these starships out in the middle of deep space, it's not there. And with an empty sick bay, it is oddly quiet and serene in your space. I don't like it. <laughs> uh, I am going to feel a little restless, like... You can just see, like, I'm just kind of, um, I think McCrell thrives in chaos and like the, in the having a problem to fix, having, you know, okay. something sure. to do, keeping her hands busy. Um, so she's going to finish her tea and, uh, maybe go make her way to the holodeck for one of her, her special programs that she has, uh, programmed. You receive one more notification just as you're about to get up from the desk. 
It's from Commander Exio, letting the entire crew of the USS Ross know that in this downtime, she is fully available for any counseling sessions that people may have been postponing, been putting off, have been declining, have been trying to not make time for. Now is the perfect time. Her schedule is quite open at the moment, so if you would like to make an appointment, she is available to you at your convenience. You know how when like you receive a message and you know that someone else is in that thread, but you forward it to them just in case so they get it twice? I do that to Sorax. And uh, just so, <laughs> just to make sure, like, uh, okay. did you see this part? Um, okay. Just, you know, uh, I know he's dealing with a lot of memories and things. Sure. Okay. But in, but in it, as I do that, I'll, I'll add to it. Like, I am also available for any session with a question mark, and then. <laughs> go away. The moment you send the message, it's, it's that brief moment where you're starting to wonder if you didn't accidentally throw innuendo at him just then. And it's yes. that moment of like anxiety of like, well, I'm committed, like it's done. I, <laughs> like, I, I already did it. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I have stirred the pot. I remember that one. <laughs> I have pot stirred the, the thing. All right. So as you rise from your desk, we're going to cut down to main engineering, the go, center go, go. console, <laughs> with Captain Sol leaning over the center console and the chief engineer, Tech, currently going through some of the diagnostic cycles when you hear a bellow, where is that bullion? Where is he? Ah, geez. Okay, here we go. You ready? Uh-huh. No. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes is the correct answer. <sighs> yes. You stood up to so many people who outrank you by so much and they call you sir now. You can do this. I got this. You do. I'm Rounding. over here, uh, yeah. Dr. Maroney. What, what a surprise. Rounding the corner about your rank. is that stocky, five foot seven, well-built Tellarite with the ancient lined face, the thick beard that gets kind of cut short doesn't have that long, thick, epic beard that a lot of Tellarites have. This one is just more like fluffed outward, but cut pretty short, hair pulled back, wearing the the standard like engineering, uh, like something that an, that an engineer would wear at a, a formal event. Their long coat denoting that they're a doctor of engineering. Uh, they are wearing what looks like very formalized clothes underneath and a utility belt. They are heavily thudding around the corner, like stomping and the fury. The thing is, is Tellarites already look naturally pissed off in their resting state. They look like they're just angry as fuck at everybody that they look at. And this one with widened eyes as he spots you looks like he's on the verge of frenzy. And that just seems to be a default state of when a Tellarite looks pissed off and they actually are pissed off. This one looks like he is ready to throw down with you when he rounds the corner. And like a thunderstorm, he storms up to you and looks up at you and says, what have you done to my ship? You bite your tongue and choke yourself to sleep, you miserable old man. <laughs> and then he puts his arms on your shoulders and just shakes you and he says, you kept it from blowing up. That's what you did, isn't it? I managed to perfect the two warp cores, something that you never did. No, I didn't get to drive her around the galaxy. I had to build her first so that you could go ruin her. Well, someone's got to do it. Uh, oh, hi, Captain. <laughs> Good to see you again. You're looking very green as usual. And you. Good to see the two of you have this in hand. Chief, I'm off to my lunch break. Yeah, you I were. I mean, yeah, I, I sir. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Captain. I won't let myself rub off on him too much. <laughs> there are worse influences. I can't think of them. And I take off. I am, in fact, trusting my chief and being less of a hypocrite. Just very slightly less, shall we call it, character growth. Okay. Nay, I would not go too far. That is yet <laughs> too far. But the holodeck is not yet too far. On a lunch break. A little bit. Okay. A retreat. You had a, a deck 11. All of deck one is currently fully available to you. Uh, this Tellarite turns and looks at you, Chief Tech, and just says, all right, 
We've got a lot to do. So when I, when I brought my engineering team with me to help coordinate with yours, but I don't want there to be a lot of uh, cross wires. Hey, <laughs> too many cooks, right? That's something you get more than anybody being a cook. So yeah, I here's actually- what we're gonna do. Oh. I'm gonna give you lead on this. She's uh -huh. your ship. I built her, but she's your ship. I was a chief engineer at one point in my life, and I wouldn't wish that on anybody ever again. But now that I build these things, I think it's important that we have one voice. So I'm going to be your user manual. You ask me and I'll help do whatever you need. My engineering team came all the way out here from Utopia Planitia, and we're going to be helping you in any way we can. But this is going to be your refit job. Sound good? It sounds like a plan. I got to be honest with you, though. I'm more of a hands-on, do-it-yourself type of person. I'm going to set up a member of my team as like a sous chef, to put it in my terms. And she's going to be a liaison between us. If I have any questions, Ensign Dari will be the one uh, that I'll send over. You see him hesitate and says, So you're... So I've got to answer to Incendari if I want my to have kitchen, a conversation with you. My rules. Take it or leave it. <laughs> Come here for a second. Come here. Mm -hmm. Um I'll take my starship and that sweet sensor suite with me and fly my ass back to Starfleet Command and let them know that the engineer was rude to me. Hmm. You could do that. And then you'd have to explain why the Ross is sent all the way back and put out a commission when we've spent so much time refitting it and doing amazing things. Have you heard about our doctor? We've got some pretty uh, good people on this ship and um, I think we've got it handled. You want me to answer to an ensign? Now, when you say answer, I'm just saying a liaison. You're going to be doing your thing. I'm going to be neck deep into some engine parts. We just need someone that can do some running. I know we've got the communicators. Listen, I'm just trying to do her a favor, okay? She really wants to meet you. Roll. Okay. <laughs> well, this is like deeply me. offended Tellarite and... You're gonna make a, this is a presence command check. If you have any diplomatic skills or anything like that. <laughs> we have two momentum in the pool. Okay. Um, we do not, we change scenes way too many times. We did, we have one, oh, yeah. One we have yeah, you're right, zero. it's gonna be the same. Um, you, you know, I'm okay letting that slide. This is all just one because, big scene of what we're doing. Because because the thing is, is this episode we're going to be doing a lot of jump arounds, and I mm -hmm. don't want to penalize the party because of that. Okay. Because everyone is divided up a lot, and it would be really crappy to just constantly penalize you guys' momentum. Take so, a momentum, Chief. Ooh. Do it. So we're gonna we're gonna classify scenes. I'll let you guys know when you need to subtract a momentum. How's that? Okay. But we is it we'll at all say, possible that my pre pep talk can count as an assist? <laughs> Yes, okay. Abs okay. absolutely. Can, can, they burn it? can they burn it? Uh, can she burn it? Uh, sorry, can he burn it as a directive? To get to... Uh, you mean, can? well, that would be calling upon your determination for this for the episode if you want to do that. I also have a value that might be able to help here too, but uh, what's the difficulty that we're looking at? Uh, well, the difficulty is one, and it's a contested roll against him. Uh -huh. So we want to run up the score. Here. Right. So what what is it? It's going to be insight. In, it's going to be it's going to be presence command. Presence command. Yeah, it's his insight command. Okay, I would like to use a value. I have two that might uh, apply, either or, or three actually. The uh, yeah, two <laughs> the directive or okay. don't hear, listen, or everyone can be helped. Because that's the motivation behind this. Everyone can be helped is perfect for this. Great. I would like to burn my determination for two right. successes. I am spending two threat. Hey. <laughs> I'm going to uh, burn one momentum for an extra day. Okay. Uh, so two successes and a complication. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, I know exactly what the complication is. So that's oh, no. four. That's four total successes for 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 uh, tech. The captain grants too. 
Okay. And one momentum left. So you're gonna beat him by two. <laughs> and he he looks at you, narrows his eyes for a second, and says, "Is she a fan?" Mm -hmm. Okay, but is it a professional fan or is it a fan? Which one do you prefer? The uh, a professional fan. I don't want somebody gobbing over me. I need to work. If this oh, is somebody she... who likes what I do, then we can work together. Absolutely. She's all about it. That's all she talks about is the stuff that you get up to. Okay. And she's good at what she does. She's not going to be a pain. I wouldn't recommend her otherwise. <sighs> I mean, I used to be that kid, so sure, fine. Wow, this is way more reasonable than I thought you'd be. <laughs> Look at us. Look uh, at you. All right, all right, all right, all right. Stick to the real insults. All right. You're out of right. Now get out of here. That's better. <laughs> all right, where is she? Introduce me to her. Let's get this out of the way. Chief Tech to Ensign Dari, please report to main engineering. She's there. She comes Ooh. around the corner and says, hi, I'm sorry. I was actually, um, I was just maintenancing the 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 Me. and he interrupts her and says you lost it on the second the it could have been a stutter which would have been understandable but now clearly everyone knows you're making shit up and she goes yes and Sindari, this is dr maroney dr maroney it's such a pleasure to meet you i have studied the manuals your designs of the uss ross and your proposal is it just it spoke to me i i want you to know that the whole reason why i wanted to serve on board this ship was when i got to see her blueprints for the very first time um it, it's it's a real honor and he says it was a team of engineers that put the ross together i just had the initial idea i mean let's be honest two warp cores in a starship is ridiculous <laughs> it's just absurd but hey Lots of power, and you seem to have not blown her up, so let's see what we can do about wiring in this new sensor suite so that y'all can spot Tholians better. Sound good? She's like, yes, sir, that sounds great. He's like, you don't have to do the sir thing. I'm not actually an officer. Just Maroney or DeBlutch is fine. People call me Deebs back at Starfleet. If you want to call <laughs> me Deebs, you can do that. Uh -huh. She's like, Deebs. Yeah, that's, <laughs> Deebs is great. Trust me. By the time we're done, we're all going to be sweaty and irritated as hell with each other from crawling around inside the guts of this ship. You're not going to want to use formalities. Just call me Deebs. Do you have a nickname? Can I call you something? And she goes, uh, Dari. Dari's great. Dari's short, and Dorian's are wonderful like that. Not as short as me, though. <laughs> all right, let's go. And he, with that, he moves towards the turbo lift and says, I'm going to get my engineering team over here. Are you coming? And Dari goes, yes, sir, D Deebs, and runs after him. And she looks at you kind of like, she does that thing where you think she's going to give you the, the <laughs> she does this, she goes, and follows. <laughs> gives, you the, gives you the look of like, oh, shit. Yeah. That's what you meant. Um, uh, and they disappear. Ooh, now I can get to work. Yeesh. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is LaCat doing at this point? Um, are those so what's the status of the sensors? Are they purely They're going offline. In about 24 hours, the sensors will be taken completely offline. Great. Um, so I would say she's over at the sensors collecting as many last scans as she can before it goes dark. Okay. Um, I think that it's just like one of those. Uh, Roll these files while you can before you go so off. You, you head up to the bridge and get yeah. to your science station. The uh -huh. bridge is completely empty. Great. You you also kind of are having this moment, much like the captain did, where you don't see anyone up here. It's this quiet moment. The moment you step onto the bridge, you just see the stations. They're empty. The empty captain's chair, Exio's chair, Olin's chair, like. The bridge is yours, LaCat. Sam is Com telling me to do it. Computer, uh, initiate self destruct is, is going to be a little, she, she's going to get to her station the long way around. Um, I think that first, oh God, she's such a creep. Um, she's, do she's going to everybody, go. Everybody dreams of doing it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
But but to be fair, she first stops at Prawl Station. Okay. Pretends to like, like you see her look at the captain's chair, but then she goes to Prawl Station and she's like, I am better than that. But really she's not. But she's telling herself for the second that she's better than that. So she's gonna like stand at Prawl Station, like look and see like the exact angle at which he can usually see her and Ren like talking to each other, like get an analysis of that. <laughs> yeah, so Prawl Station, first of all, it does not look like the standard Galaxy class format. It does, of course, have the tactical station built on that large beam that surrounds by, back behind the captain's chair in a typical classic Galaxy class format. However, the station is much more involved. It's much bigger. It actually has a computer console coming out the top. And Prawl has a chair up here, which is also kind of a new feature on the Ross that they didn't have necessarily in the Galaxy class. You can see the tactical readouts is quite extensive, and it looks like Prawl's made some modifications for his own edification and quick use of the tactical station. From this vantage point, he can see the entire bridge. And it's only a quick head turn left and right to be able to see what's going on behind him. But um, he has a full view. And he could see, from up here, you, you realize looking down, he's probably seen every interaction that's ever happened. He has the high ground. Um, she's he has that. that. But, uh, so she enjoys it uh, for, for a second, enjoys like just the beauty of the ship. It's a very pretty ship. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's rare she gets to be in here alone. Um, and I think then her eyes do trail down to the captain's chair. And uh, she'd like to stick a quick seat in the captain's chair. Um, I no, think that- A moment, you're not gonna get a quick seat. So you move over. Like Crap, activate. <laughs> and you- If there's any way she can do this, like cut back to our episode on Nimbus three, where she accidentally dropped her phaser and <laughs> pretended to go down just to the drop your communicator on the captain's chair. Yeah, just Whoops. like oh, no, I have to reach for it and then accidentally sit down on the captain's chair. So um, she puts on a little facade for anyone, any any like one that might wander in, but she's gonna sit on the captain's chair. So the cat, as you slide into the center chair there is a sensation of the enormity of what this chair means. Because as you, as you take that station, you see the two consoles to your left and right, just underneath your hands. Basic data readouts, damage report readouts, and whenever the captain calls for them, basic tactical displays fed right from the tactical station behind you, as well as a direct link so that if the captain ever needs, they can see what you're seeing on the sign station. You can see some of the basic readouts that are available, along with the computer console that can swivel around if the captain ever needs it. But that's not what just a, what gets you, what you see, what's really grav gravitating is the view screen, which is currently off and can be activated whenever you want with no problem. But Looking forward, you, yeah. yeah. It's just a quick tap of the button. The view screen comes on with a chirp and you see outside the USS Ross, you see dead ahead, the visual of deep space because Ross facing outward, you're not actually seeing a lot of the traffic coming in. You can change the view screen angle to any angle you want, but right now you're looking out into the black night of deep space. You're literally facing in the direction of the Shackleton expanse right now from the position that you're located. And you're imagining it, being in command of a science class starship of your very own, heading out into the unknown, planets out there with biological life that's been growing on them, plant life. I mean, imagine all of the plant life that could be waiting for you to discover out there. Um, sitting in this chair also brings with you the enormity of what comes with it. There's a sense of awe and respect for what Captain Sol has to stress out over every single time they sit in this chair. Because not only do you feel that sense of adventure, that calling to what's lying out there in that deep black sky, but you also are suddenly aware of 2,000 plus souls on board of the Ross. You're also aware of the mission parameters that are coming in from Starfleet. The organization, everyone doing their jobs in order to make this ship run. It's a city in space, the size of this vessel. It's one of Starfleet's largest vessels. And pinned on the Ross are all the hopes of diplomatic engagement with new species and mending the wounds from the Dominion War. 
and everything you've done, you're trying to imagine what it must have been like sitting in the captain's chair when you saw that Tholian dreadnought come on the view screen for the, that first time. Or what was it like for Exio showing down that admiral, that Romulan admiral, making those big decisions? And in this moment, I'm going to ask you, Ravity, does that call to Lacat? Or does Lacat shy away? Does she hear that call sitting here in the captain's chair by herself on the bridge? The idea of having a starship at your command and a galaxy waiting for you? And the galaxy waiting for me. Yes, I think she does. And it's at that moment, Lacat, you realize in that moment, you're going to be a captain one day. Oh, God. And you, you hear, and, and like the realization hits her too, I think. And you hear this, oh no. It's it, like deep, like, <sighs> um, I, why do I want this? But I want this. If this was an episode of Star Trek, right about now is when you would hear that beautiful, subtle, sentimental tone. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. cat, you take your moment and then rise up out of the chair kind of instinctively at that point. Uh, I think that she feels that and mm -hmm. then feels like, but not yet. And so she steps away um, from it. And okay. I think that she understands that she's nowhere close to that level. And I think that she thinks back to that conversation that she had with Olin about like what makes a person leave intel like an exciting job like intelligence for something like this. And like she gets it a little bit more. Um, and then she's gonna go check in on her sensors. You get to the sensor station. Um, the sensors are still working at full capacity. Right. You can run any kind of sweep you want, long range scans, whatever you'd like to do. The sensor suite is yours right now. This is one of those rare moments where the cat, you can kind of indulge yourself. You can do, you can scan and do whatever you see fit to do with the um, USS Any Ross. list of anomalies around here that I Would can- you like to scan for anomalies? Yes, please. All right, roll. A, this is gonna this is gonna get your hackles up. I need you to roll reason plus science difficulty five. What? Okay, hold on. Hold on. We have on. three momentum. We have save. momentum. Yeah, I would like to use one of my momentum. I know my crew, and I know when I throw difficulty levels at y'all, you have a just, reaction. Just, I mean, I just use them all. Why not? Why not? Um, buy yeah. buy two die. Just use them all. <laughs> Die. Let me think. Um, okay. Whew. Consider. Do it. Do it. Consider. Do it. Okay. So I'm going to do two dice then. So I'm getting four total. And I'm using my sensors uh, focus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That will absolutely come into play here. Oh, all right. One of those is a one. Oh. And um, and then that one of them great. is also a, because of my sensors focus, um, that would also be a success at being a four, right? Yes. What's your so science rate? A one, a four, a 13, and a 10. So your science is a five? Is that yes, correct? Yes, science is at a five. Okay, so that's a crit too then. Yeah. Like automatically, that's four successes. Great. And then, uh, so one, two, three. I think four, you got six. Five, six successes. So gain a momentum and you just crush a difficulty five roll. Yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. to give you guys, just to remind you, everybody, technically, the RPG, Star Trek Adventures, lists difficulty five roles as the most difficult role you can have in the game. That is, researching a subject where the facts have been thoroughly redacted from official records, shooting a small, fast-moving target with a phaser or a disruptor in poor light, or attempting tra to transport while at, warp, while at warp to another vessel at warp. These would be things that are incredibly difficult to do. And you, Lacat, as you're scanning, you start detecting very small energy readings that are not typical of, we'll put it this way, 
here at Narendra Station, with all the ships coming and going, there's the typical stuff that you scan in deep space. It's the exhaust, if you will, of ships coming and going, leaving the nacelles. You pick up plasma port discharges. You're picking up uh, antimatter reactions and warp cores, all that standard stuff that you scan and would detect. You're detecting all the life on board Narendra Station, the thousands of people that are stationed there, a huge Klingon population, and one gleam. If you imagine you were shining a flashlight over a beach at night, off a pure chance in the meticulous nature of your scans, you catch the quick flash of a reflection of something in the sand. We'll put it that way. Because the sensors, as they're sweeping across Narendra Station, the station detect a small anomalous energy signature that comes up as unregistered or never before encountered on sensors. Somewhere within the main promenade deck of Narendra Station. Oh, oh boy. Within the promenade deck. Okay. So as you bring the sensors back, it's kind of like you pass over it with the flashlight and then you're like, wait, what? What? Um, is there any way that she can... Uh, input that data and then uh, basically take that readout of what she just got and see if she can find that like glint that she saw and see if she can locate it again. You can, uh, if you spend one momentum for obtain information. Have one. Yeah, let's do exactly it. One. Um, you, it's, you cannot pinpoint precisely where it is, but it is on the main promenade deck. Okay. Which is the most populated deck on Narendra Station. It does not appear to be moving. Okay. Um, what does it share similar, like, do, do I know, like, what it shares similar traits with, or I know nothing other than it's, this shit is weird. It's an energy pattern never before recorded. Okay, great, great. Which, in this century of Star Trek, that's unusual as hell. Yeah. Um, Jane looks at that, says to herself, uh, Never a dull day. And then um, I think that she's going to try and collect as much information as she can. And I think she's just going to keep monitoring it on sensors for, for as long as she can. So I think that would say that that's, that's her scene. Unless she thinks she can go to the promenade and like actually just walk around a little. See if she can see what maybe that is. Um, you certainly can if you want. Hmm, 24 hours. You know what? Yes, we're going down to the promenade. Jane's taking a walk. All right, you transfer some of that data straight to your data pad. <laughs> log, out of your, log out of your console and dash towards the turbo lift. Yeah, grab my tricorder too, just in case. Okay. okay. Um, and yeah, she's, she's, she's out of there. She's going to the promenade. Um, I mean, I think that like, it's so weird and so unexpected. She's almost like not looking at the data right now. Mm -hmm. Just looking to see if she spots anything unusual amongst the crowd. Um, I think that this is this is almost like a perception like check in, in that regard of just her being like I mean um, why, she does not help me right now, so like can my eyes what do my elf eyes see? <laughs> So you're talking when you get to the promenade, what do you physically see as you're walking around? Yeah, yeah, like anything stand out as strange or weird. Is my suspicious by nature trait like like do anything okay. here? So you get to the transporter pad. <laughs> um, as you arrive at the transporter pad, uh, you see a face you've never seen before, a Saurian. Okay. Standing at the transporter pad with the petty officer second class logo or pin rather on their uniform, and you see this sort of dark purpled skin with some of the mottled like green blended into the back. But when you come in, you see them stiffen up and go, "Sir," like nervously. But you do you need transport, sir? Can I beam you over to Narendra Station, sir? Uh, yes, please, just to the promenade. To the promenade, yes, sir. This is one of those litter boy, the lizard boys, right? Lizard boys, Saurians are reptilian in descent, yes, but they're okay. not, this is not the same as a Gorn. Okay, <laughs> Gorn, great. Gorn look like walking dinosaurs. This looks very reptilian in nature. No visible nose that you can see. It's more like two slits, sort of an angular face, of, sort of like bulbous back head, large, beautiful green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
cool. large, beautiful, like green lizard eyes, like the slits. Um, judging from the looks, this petty officer looks quite nervous as you move over to the transporter pad. Nervous people are fine. Was it just a, I caught you during an hour that you thought you could be slacking off? Because no, it was more of like, I mean, if you want, if you want to make a, if you want to make an insight command check, I'll give it to you. Yeah, of course. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Insight uh, command difficulty one. Let's do it. Um, was he looking at something he wasn't supposed to? Um, okay. That makes me a, uh, two successes. Thank God. A five and an eight. Okay. Everything about this Soren, Sorian. Mm-hmm indicates to you, reads to you immediately that this is probably their first time ever by themselves at the transporter unit. <laughs> and this is their very first time ever initiating like a beam out. This is, this is their first time without the trainer, the trainer like over, looking over their shoulder and is beaming somebody over. Oh my God. Um, do these things make you nervous? Sir? Nervous? Yeah. I'm asking you because they make me really nervous. Oh, no. No, sir. No, no, no. I'm sorry, sir. No. Um, they, the transporter doesn't make me nervous. I, I'm i sorry, sir. I don't I don't mean to be nervous. I've, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, just... I'm not trying to call you out for being nervous. I'm... And James just had this experience where she just sat on a chair and like thought about her future and like thought about like the kind of leader she wants to be. And so I think Here's that- your first opportunity to be command. Yeah, this is, this is weird. She just rolled a command and she doesn't, it's, it's all right. She tries out the words. Make a presence <laughs> command check, difficulty is one. Um, great, five and a six. And okay. uh, yeah, that'll work. That'll do, okay. Pig, that'll it do. comes. You might be feeling shaky about what you're saying, LaCat. Yeah. But after having the reflections and feeling that captain's chair and realizing the real, having the realization you have, as insecure as you might be feeling, when you say it, it comes out. You're, you kind of surprise yourself. It's said with confidence and authority and patience. And as you say it, you see his shoulders sink a little bit, like maybe the tension just dropped out of his neck for a split second. And the Sarian nods and says, yes, Lieutenant, thank you. Jane registers that like, oh, that was a positive experience. And uh, nods and steps up to the transporter. Uh, I'm, yeah. Uh, says, I'm, Petty Officer Rovas, by the way. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, she turns and to him uh, to face him and says, "It's actually Rovas." Quick, correct, quick correction. Yeah. Um, because I didn't get a chance to specify this. Rovas is they them. Great. Um, uh, turns to turns to them. Uh, Petty Officer Rovas. Uh, nice to meet you, Jane Lacat. Um, Lieutenant Jane Lacat. Um, and then she's going to do like the Cardassian handshake, which is what I'm calling the, like a grip with the forearms instead of the hands. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, just stick just... it out for no prisoner, take no prisoner shake. Okay. Uh, shakes, he, ma they match the, as best they can yeah. and kind of smile and nod at you. This sort of like, you see the subtle crease of a smile on their face as they nod to you and says, well, I, I shouldn't take up any more of your time, Lieutenant. Let me have you beamed over there now. Great. I wasn't lying when I said I was nervous around these. And she steps up into the transporter. Completely safe. Energizing. And the last thing you see of the USS Ross as you beam over to the station is this Saurian who looks quite friendly as they're looking at you seeming to have this sort of instilled confidence in themselves after having the interaction with you and the blue curtain of energy flows across your eyes and you rematerialize on the transporter pad of Narendra Station. In front of you is your data pad that's indicating, feeding, being, having fed the sensor data from the USS Ross, you have 
an estimation of where this energy reading is located at. Perfect. Um, I want to make a beeline for the general area, but okay. like I said, I think that um, how like Jane's pretty familiar with the station by this point, right? Oh um, yeah. So it's not like she needs the map. So I would say that she's actually no. not even she she like looks at where she needs to go and she's keeping her eyes on her surroundings at this point and just seeing if she can see anything unusual. Um, I think yes. they're like the data is only telling gotcha. her so much. It's an unknown signature. Might as well figure out if there's anything else that yeah my elf eyes can see. So this is going to be like an investigation role. Cool. So if you have anything like that as you're Scooby doing around the station, hmm, I have. I'm going to have you roll. This is definitely an insight science roll. Oh, this is interesting. It's it's weird to roll stuff that you're only mediocre at, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be a difficulty two check. Okay, great. Um, Insight science. We're running like two moments. Okay, great. <laughs> um, oh my god, that is skin of my teeth, folks. I got two successes. Okay. Yeah. It's about an hour just moving throughout the promenade because this place has changed a lot since the Ross was last here. Narendra Station has become a bit of a hub of activity because people have started to become more and more interested about the frontier. This typically happens at frontier stations that are opened up to trade. Narendra Station is slowly becoming like the new DS9. Out here on the frontiers of the Shackleton Expanse, who knows what resources or goods or wonders that are waiting people who want to explore this part of the Milky Way, which has been largely untouched since long before the Dominion War. Now that the Federation has access to it and that the galaxy is relatively at peace, you're seeing species from across the spectrum all flooding into Narendra Station. The promenade is filled with different types of people wondering about. And as I recall, I did mention last time, you see a bunch of new shops have sprouted up. And as you have been moving about, there are eateries, there are souvenir shops, trade shops, um, tailors, a lot of people here to try to take advantage of the people who are coming through. And as you spend an hour walking around the mass, yesterday massive promenade of Narendra Station, you manage to find yourself on the opposite side of the wasted space, far mm -hmm. into the removed part where uh, some of the hollow suites used to be located before they were taken offline and actually moved into the lower decks. You see a shop has been set up here that you starting to feel like this might be what you're looking for. And outside, you can see the shop either is relatively new or it's being taken apart. Interesting. Um, and what's located on either side? Um, nothing immediately. On um, either side is just kind of this long wall of bulkhead, along with a couple of like holographic images of some of the worlds that have been scanned from a distant distance uh, here at Narendra, like images of what has been seen through the telescopes, as it were, of like worlds that could be waiting for people out there in the Shackleton expanse. What you see is the shop itself looks like it is set up in a very classical style where you see shelves and whatnot, all kind of lining the walls, um, cases that seem to be filled with knickknacks and strange artifacts you've never seen before. Many of them look quite alien. Some of them look like maybe they were handcrafted. Okay. But uh, the one thing that stands out to you is at the very back of the shop is a Ferengi who is currently leaning over what looks like a uh, like the shop center, like this desk that separates from the back warehouse of the shop itself. But it's circular, allowing him to step forward and be able to engage people on all sides. But it is towards the back of the shop. So it's like a half oval shape. And over his head in holographic images, read the words Timok. Timok. Timok's Shops of Artifacts and Wonders. Um, okay. Um, so before Jane enters, she wants to check one more thing. Um, are there windows to this storefront? There are no windows, no. Great. Um, what can you see from the front door? Just real quick. Looking in? 
Yeah, no, no, no. Like if you were standing at the front door, what could you see? Looking out? Yeah, looking out. You would just see the swath of crowd of people moving through Narendra Station. Okay. And this huge wall of uh, like the viewports here are almost floor to ceiling. Meaning they they reach up like 60 meters straight up and are wide enough. You can see all of the activity happening around outside of New Ranger Station. Cool. I think Jane just wanted to double check. There wasn't any significance to the specific location for the shop being set up. But it seems more like this guy has something he might have collected um, along his way. So she's going to... Um, like slip the data pad, um, pocket the data pad, pocket the tricorder, and then um, head inside for a conversation. All right. So as you slip the data pad in, Lacat, mm -hmm. you take a deep breath and step inside of Timox. Okay. And that is where we're going to pause for our break because it's eight oh four. Great. So we're going to take ten minutes, use bathroom, grab drinks, refresh, come back, and find out what the hell is going on and what's inside this shop. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Welcome back to Clear Skies, everybody. We are going to jump right back into the game where we left off uh, with Lacat wandering into a mysterious Ferengi shop here on Narendra Station, tracking down a bizarre energy reading that she detected right before leaving the bridge of the USS Ross, which is currently undergoing a major refit, getting upgraded sensor suite installed. Um, Lacat, when you move into the shop, it is a splash of color everywhere. And these are like the typical Ferengi tones of like deep tans and golds. Of course, the color of Latinum is everywhere. Um, almost like he was trying to bless his own shop, just splattering the color of golds and browns and earth tones everywhere. Um, you do see there are some pets in here. It looks like there are some strange little life forms. There's one little bitty like miniature creature that looks like it has just, it doesn't look like it has legs per se, but like, a, like its body is almost conical shaped and it's slightly wrinkly, has at the very bottom these two big thick toes and an almost like adorable face with two large eyes and a big sort of like grinning smiley face with these short hands. It's hanging from a small twig in the middle of this, uh, what looks like a sort of an aquarium with this sort of mist blowing into it that kind of gives it this mysterious air, but it might have something more to do with life support. Little bitty knickknacks and animals that can be found throughout the shop, as well as like weapons and artifacts and all these other knickknacks. You're also seeing a lot of them look like they're boxed up or in the process of being boxed up. And when you walk in, what you might be expecting is maybe a friendly greeting from a Ferengi to a prospective customer. But what you get is Tomok, this Ferengi that's about 5'2", dressed in a vest of dark purples and browns, looks up at you, eyes you for a moment, and just goes, Nothing is on discount, so please don't ask. I don't have anything that I'm willing to sell on discount. The clearance sale is not really a sale. It's mostly me just trying to get rid of everything that I can. Does he stop talking after that? Yes, he goes back to his okay. he looks like he goes back to a data pad. Almost like he's ignoring you now. Okay. He looks down um, at it. Why are you moving out? Because no like one's buying anything. No one's buying anything. No one's buying anything. I'm Aren't broke. You, isn't this your... Jane stops for a second and, like, thinks about how she's going to phrase this in a diplomatic way. Okay. Because um, she's trying to be... Di this, is, this is Jane trying to be diplomatic for once in her life. Okay. Um, <laughs> This, she's trying something new, guys. <laughs> she might not wear it forever. Um, but <laughs> right now. Um, I mean, seems like you've got plenty of interesting stuff in here, the way I see it. Well, I do have plenty of really interesting things, that's true. But unfortunately, nobody wants to buy them. So I'm going out of business. I'm a failure, just like my mother told me I was going to be. That's so sad. Um, Is it? She, she's trying empathy right now. I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> Your mother thought you were going to be a failure. Well, she was right. And that's valuable. It's good to know. I can plan accordingly. Plan? Mm. I mean, 
Where did you get those? She's, she's Jane is so bad at small talk. So she she's gonna point at the small creatures because she looks up. He, he looks up at what you're pointing at, and he goes, "Those are Mogari testicles." Ah. I got those from a Mogari. Did did they willingly give them over, or did you? It was dead. I didn't ask it, but they sold them to me for a very reasonable price. Okay. They're, yeah. so, they're supposed to be good in pie. And he goes back to looking at his pad. And he's like, and then he looks up and he says, "Did you want them?" Yeah, actually, maybe I have a friend who is very good at cooking. I, I know Bolian who would probably find something to do with these. One, please. Oh, they come in pairs. Two, please. Two. Two. <clears throat> See? He rings you, you it up and he says, mm-hmm. And I'm guessing you're paying with Federation credits. He kind of looks at you disdainfully up and down, noticing your blue uniform. Unfortunately, yes. That's all right. I'll take what I can get. Right. Um, there you go. I'm going to take a quick look around. Any favorites that I should keep an eye out for? I'm still shopping. Well, I suppose I could help if you're serious. I mean, you did just buy Magari testicles. And I've never heard of anyone actually buying those. Let's uh, let's start over here. Um, yes, uh, what are you in the... Are you, are you just sort of grazing, as it were? Are you actually looking for something specific? It's... And she makes up a lie on the spot. It's my friend Sam's birthday, and mm. I'm looking for a present for them. Hmm. You're looking for a birthday present for Sam. Yes, that would be correct. What species is Sam? <laughs> Ooh, this is a great question. I can do anything. Um, this could make a big difference. I mean, yes. Um. They are incredibly kind, but also think they're very funny with all the puns they make, and I don't believe they, they're they as funny mm. as those, so, they, those puns are. Mm, so they pun and they're incredibly kind. Yes. Um, would not it, make a very good Ferengi. Would, yes, they're not a Ferengi. Um, not a Ferengi. Not a Ferengi. Um, just like a game of guess who, but like Jane is trying to come up with their friend Sam right now, and me Ravity doesn't know very many Star Trek people. <laughs> so we're just gonna. They're a Romulan. They're a Romulan named Sam. Um. You can be whoever you want to be. I'm a Cardassian named Jane, and here we are. Jane. Jane. I didn't mm. want Delilah, and I didn't want Jolene, so I picked Jane. Well, as far as I'm concerned, whatever name you choose is your damn name, so I'll take it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, gift for Sam. Um, All right, well, what, let's see. Do you have anything here that is more recent? I think they're actually, they frequent the shop, so if they Nobody frequents this shop. I mean, I'm frequenting this shop, not, I mean, I will be a frequenter, I will be back. Cardassian Jane, who is a Starfleet officer. Yes. You are perhaps the most pathetic liar that has ever walked through the doors of my shop. I'm trying to give you some pointers. Don't answer too many questions, because everything you've just told me now has to be true somehow. Keep it vague. You're shopping for a friend. Now you've told me you're shopping for a friend named Sam, who's not a Ferengi. And it's their so, birthday. And it's their birthday. So these are the things that now have to be true. Now, what if I was somebody that you needed to depend on? You're going to have to keep up with these lies. Don't keep piling them on. If you want to be a really good liar, let the person you're lying to fill in the blanks for you and okay. just affirm what they're hearing. So, for example, I can tell you that these testicles definitely do not cause Grafafian plague. They definitely don't. What are you thinking oh, right now? They that definitely they probably do, do correct? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, they don't. But there's an example. If you lead people to the truth, they'll find whatever truth they want. 
happens all the time. All the best politicians do it. Oh, I know. Anyway, present for Sam. Present for Sam. So you're not looking for... Where do you get these items? Just on your adventures? Oh, across, yes, across my travels. And uh, through various trades and other activities that are perfectly legal here in the Alpha and Beta Quadrants. Oh, you have to believe that because you just told me it. Well, well, I mean, that's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, Are you looking for something like jewelry? No, uh, really anything. Let's keep doing around. Um, where do sure, you I have from? all the time in the world for you, Jane. You have no other customers. Thank you. And I bought these testicles. You did. You bought the balls, so I guess I'll sell you something else. Thank you. Very well. Um, well, there's this. I don't precisely know exactly what it is. He reaches down and picks up what looks like a large coin. It's about mm-hmm. this large, big, like, disc-looking thing. But what's remarkable about it is in the dead center, it looks like it has some kind of stone. Do I recognize this stone? No, it looks like some kind of, like, maybe a gem of some kind. He picks it up and looks at it and says, don't know where I got this on some trade. Uh... 20 credits. How's that? Lovely. Do you go to buy? She pulls out her her um, tricorder. Okay. Um, okay. Reason science check difficulty zero. And he goes. Oh, so, so actually, there's there. So she pulls out. She, she pulls out her tricorder, and I want to ask okay. to do this first. She pulls out her tricorder um, and says, "Do you mind if I scan it?" And if no. he, he's no, no mind. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and then she'd like to. So she's told him that she's gonna like scan this item, but she'd like to like do some sort of like stealth check so that she can actually, or like a deception check, so she can actually scan as much of the room as possible. Oh. Uh, see if she can gain, uh, but she'd like to make it seem like an accident. Um, okay. Oh no, Jane, the stupid Cardassian just accidentally scanned the whole store. Also. I mean, it's, it, that's, I mean, I'm gonna give that to you because when right. you pull out a tricorder, it's, you can, e- I mean, especially in an enclosed space this size, you will easily be able to scan the entire room. Beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah it, it's not gonna be that difficult. Great. So go ahead um, and make a reason science check. Awesome. Uh, the difficulty would normally be three here, but you're using a tricorder, so I'm gonna drop it down to two. Beautiful. Um, and yeah, this is, this is an easy one. I got two successes, my friend. Um, whatever the rest of the store has in it doesn't matter because the thing he's holding in front of you is the source of the power. It's literally blocking off the rest of your sensor scans. It is emanating some kind of low hum of energy that's crackling inside that gym. This looks like a metal, uh, like a metal piece of currency that has a centered gym on the inside of it, but your scans immediately detect that that gym is actually trillions in trillions of what looks like a latticework of matrix intricately interwoven inside to create the appearance of what looks like some sort of synthetic diamond. But is in fact, if you didn't know any better, an ancient computer core inside this coin. The cool. you need to come back on the tricorder or enough to cause the breath to catch in the back of your throat. Yep. He's got an artifact of untold value that he's holding and he doesn't seem to realize it. Exactly. I don't I don't think think he just goes 20 credits, take it or go. I'll take it, I guess. All right. Okay. Rings you up, does the transfer across the data pad. Um, you have your allocation of credits that are available to Starfleet officers on shore leave outside of Starfleet territory. 20 credits is nothing. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is great. Um, yeah. I, do you have a card? I do, yes. Um, just let me go dig it up. You know, uh, you have a data pad. Can I just transfer it to your data pad? It's better yeah. anyway. I was going to put it in this gift for Sam so they could knew where to come back if they wanted I'm probably not going to be here. The shop is closing. I'm mm-hmm. not making any money. How so much more? Okay. And she points at the little twig uh, 
the toy creature that you pointed out earlier. The fuzzy. The Murphle? The Murphle is 200 credits. <sighs> Do I? <laughs> That's the rest of your credits. Yeah, what, what, what's, what's the credit? Okay, well, you know, he's cute. <laughs> Uh, they are cute. They're also going extinct, poor things. Dang it. I have to get it. I have to get it. He said that. Um, and Very well. There are no returns. I won't be here. You won't be here. It's okay. Uh, <clears throat> he moves over to the Murphle, this little bitty thing. Um, for reference, because I'm totally ripping something off here, the Murphle that I'm describing for those of you who might be familiar with it or who have the capacity to Google, I am essentially borrowing the character design of the little bitty creature that is in the last, uh, that's in uh, Flight of the Navigator. Oh, I'm Googling right now. Creature. Oh. <laughs> the reaction of everybody. <laughs> So this Merkle seems quite excited as you move over and purchase it and <laughs> just kind of swipes and says, well, there you go. He's, he's all yours. Name him whatever you want. Oh, I will. What's your name again? My name? Yeah. Timok. Timok. Mm -hmm. She looks down at the Merkle. Timok Jr. Junior? What is Junior? Small. Timok Small? That's my understanding of it anyway. I'm still- Isn't blue about. supposed to be science? But Aren't you supposed to be intelligent? I'm gonna walk away from that and uh, pretend- I know about them going extinct, by the way. You could learn a thing or two from me as you start leaving the store. I'm gonna not pick a fight and uh, <laughs> not like, throw a punch. I'm gonna be a captain one day. I'm gonna be a captain one day as you're <laughs> walking out of the store, just kind of repeating it to yourself over and over with a bag full of testicles and this ancient artifact and this little merple thing in your right hand. Little merple in my right hand. Yeah, that's it's it's we're going back to Tex. That's what we're going. We're okay. Back these testicles. I need. I don't want these. <laughs> Tech is currently in main engineering. Would you like to go visit Tech? Sure. All right. We're going to do a quick cut scene before we get back to everybody else. Yeah. Um, you have been working diligently. It, this is this day. This is day one. This is planning Tech. Everything that's happening right now is setting up for the engineering teams to be organized and, and to know what their duty stations are and to be aware of all the heavy lifting that's gonna be happening, how to use the equipment. There's a team of about 400 engineers from Narendra Station that are helping. Is That's intermixed with the 100 engineers that came out here with Dr. Maroney. Um, them coordinating with the Ox crew engineering team, most of them here eagerly by volunteer, um, you're coordinating a team of about 500 people total. Whew. <clears throat> and so everyone is getting through as they're talking about like, this is gonna be your duty station. Um, Dr. Maroney is 100% organized and working quite well with everybody. Okay. Clearly, this is something he is quite used to. As somebody who helps build ships, he knows exactly how to fill in the gaps and help you get organized with your teams um, when you give orders, he is the person that steps forward and supplements. Okay, if he wants this done, this is how we're going to do it. You're going to divide to this. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. Then he runs it by you. Does that sound good to you? And then he runs back and says, okay, we're going to make an adjustment here. It's been, it's like you would kill for Dr. Maroney. Yes, I know. Thank you. <laughs> I did this myself. It's the new Yes, Ready Massive. <laughs> yes, Rave. It's been. <laughs> we are slowly destroying the entire English language. Yeah, we, we started with English. numbers like nine and two. Things can't be too large lest they become massive. And now, simple, <laughs> simple structures. Right. Cower in, the middle, in the middle of this, now there's not enough room here in main engineering to actually supplement this. So you're actually having holographic discussions with people who are on standby in Cargo Bay 1 who are bringing in some of the heavy equipment from Narendra Station and from the neighboring starship. Um, as this is happening, you're sitting there with Dr. Moroni when from around the corner, <laughs> striding forward without any, without any no notice that it's happening, and some of the crew moving aside comes Jane LeCat, holding a bag of something in her left hand. She strides forward. Are you just going to hand it to him? Uh, yeah, I mean, that? I want to make sure that I have the ancient coin as well. You do have it. As well as the bag of testicles, but guess which one he's getting first. You hand him over. 
Yeah, I, I say... Lieutenant? Uh, here you, um, you You are holding what seems to be some kind of... Uh, if you didn't know any better, they, they it looks like meat of some kind. You're not sure exactly what it is, but you've been handed something that is clearly organic in nature. I saw it come out of you. Please tell me these don't belong to somebody. I mean, at one point they did, but as you can see, they currently do not. They now belong to me, as I paid for them, and they are rightfully mine. As is the Ferengi way, I'm pretty sure I'd be told. Anyway. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, I know you're incredibly busy, so... I thought that might cheer you up. And then I'll do this. And then she holds up the coin. Okay. Ancient computer core. What? And he'll sort of set the testicles aside. He's yeah. just going to set the testicles aside. Yeah. And uh, you the pull up- we get on clear skies. <laughs> <laughs> um, you pick up this computer core. Um, yeah, you don't know what you're holding. It's as I described, you can't see the lattice work with the naked eye. Uh. But it looks like it almost just looks like a like tech. It literally just looks like a knickknack. It doesn't look like she handed you anything. You can tell that it's made out of some kind of metal. And the gem in the center is quite pretty. Mm. But what is this supposed to be? You're not exactly sure what it is you're holding. Um, I'd like to transfer my like data scan to him that I took in okay. the shop. Um, okay. Like airdrop it to his tablet. <laughs> sure. Uh, and uh, while I'm doing that, with while not even just like paying attention to whatever's going on with tech space. Um, just like to add that those, uh, those do great in pies, apparently. Oh, oh, those. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, um, we're kind of in the middle of something important. I heard, so I'm going to let you be, but... I appreciate I, this, Jane. I do. I turn to him, and then I say, I did some sensor readings in my downtime, and we've never seen anything like what that's giving off, ever. This or the, oh, this, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I did not really scan those, but I think it is this. Okay, well, we're gonna put this away for a project another time. I agree, I agree. I just, I'm bad at sitting still and that's what I found out. Anyway, well, I'll get back to it. I know you're busy. I hope you finished up your scans because we're going to have to shut them off for quite some time as we uh, refit everything. She curses and Ooh. remembers <laughs> what she originally was trying to do. Which I'm picturing Jane just like in the middle of all these engineers that are watching you two have this conversation as Chief Tech puts down a bag of testicles and is holding an ancient <laughs> artifact. Jane just goes, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> when how much longer do I have? Uh, well, we were about to turn them off pretty soon, but we're still in the planning stages if you need a couple minutes. Uh, just one last one. Just one last one. All right, make it quick. She's gonna run. Um, and I think that she just wants to do, like, one last general scan to see if there's any more of that energy signature or if it's firmly on the, um, if it's firmly on the Ross now, basically... You want to you want to cross reference and make sure that you got the thing you were looking for essentially. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, a quick scan would indicate that yes, you are holding what you were looking for. Awesome. Um, yeah. Great. So, uh, taps are calm. Uh, <clears throat> click that to tech. Go for tech. Uh, yeah, you can shut my babies off. Thank you for your permission. This mm -hmm. is Chief Petty Officer. Tech Linatus, we are officially turning off these scanners for the USS Ross. And um, you get that notification, Captain, as you're in the holodeck. Everybody who's on board the Ross um, and everybody, any of the department heads that are on Narendra Station, Ox Crew, at this point, you would all get the notification from the USS Ross this, that the sensors are being taken offline and that the USS Ross is officially moved into standby mode. So she is now at low power across the board. Your holodeck program is going to run just fine. But she, all non-essential systems, save for what the captain deems worthy to use, is currently being removed from online. One enjoys one's prerogatives. <laughs> yep. Hey. Um, all right. So as all of that is happening, Aki, You are, unless you've got something else you want to do, I was going to start your encounter with Ambassador Pagino. 
I mean, we can only hold this off for so long. Yeah. So you find yourself standing outside the Romulan Embassy. Um, the Romulan Embassy has definitely been decorated since you were last here. It has the two flags, these giant green banners of the Romulan Star Empire with the two rising raptors. Uh, it's quite an imperialistic look, and it's certainly more ostentatious than the Klingon Embassy. The Romulans definitely went out of their way to let you know that when you enter this embassy, you are in Romulan territory, officially. Um, as you walk in, it is a comfortable space that almost reminds you of a slight Delton aesthetic. Things in here are kind of minimalistic. There's lots of silks that you can see around some of the sitting areas, lots of comfort. You can definitely get a sense of serenity as you move into the area. There's these bright warm colors of golds and dark greens and shades of brown. Uh, it's quite fascinating. These dark imperialistic grays and greens as well, um, covering the back wall where you see a hologram of the raptor. Um, and you see the liaison at the desk. Now, the desk does not have a chair. The liaison, she appears to be standing there. Um, she glances up at you from this position, and you remember uh, this is uh, Nale, the uh, ambassador's envoy, personal envoy. This is sort of like Pagino's uh, yeoman, essentially. Nale looks at you as you approach, and you see this Romulan. She is. You can you can you've spent your life growing up, learning how to read people, and understanding like where do they come from, who are they, how are they going to speak, what would be offensive, those kinds of things, the little intricacies that you've learned through your training as a di as a diplomat and an ambassador. Um, Nale comes off to you like this is a woman that has been groomed all of her life to become the pinnacle of refinement and presentation. She stands with perfect posture. She has the perfect bold Romulan cut all the way across and a very fitted imperialistic looking Romulan uh, top that has that sort of gray, silvered and black uh, like uniform of the Romulan Navy. And she has a sash that goes across of dark greens that indicate that she's an attache of the Romulan embassy here, indicating various signs, some of which you don't even recognize which isn't unusual because Romulans are quite secretive about how they conduct their business, but you do see lots of insignias and representations of achievements on this sash and an indication of the office that she works for. And when she sees you approach, those sharp eyebrows barely move as she speaks to you and says, Ambassador Olin Marginil, a pleasure. What can I do for you today? I believe that Ambassador Pagino is expecting me. I will check with the ambassador at once. Please, make yourself comfortable. May I bring you refreshment? Um, just water will be fine, thank you. She removes herself, and moments later, one of the station's holograms, a human, comes forward with a glass of water replicated for you, and sets it down right in front of you, and does a quick bow, and then, before your very eyes, goes <laughs> fades. A few moments later, she emerges as you're sipping your water and says, the ambassador has been waiting for you. He'll see you now. Thank you, Nolly. She nods and leads you into the office. Now, this looks exactly like your office here on Narendra. It looks exactly like Jaws' office. The only difference is, is that, of course, it is decorated in all the refinements of the Romulan Star Empire. However, that's not quite a lot. In fact, a sort of in tandem with what you saw outside, this place is very minimalistic. On Earth, for those of you who are familiar with Japanese culture, this would be very zen-like atmosphere, a very minimalist atmosphere, where only what is necessary is being provided in comfort and in status. You don't see a lot of indications of history or anything like that. You do see a couple of pieces of Romulan art, which is a rare sight to see on this side of the quadrant, um, pottery and whatnot. But for the most part, the place is just comfortable and sparse. His desk is quite vacant of any refinements or trophy or anything like that. And he is seated behind what looks like his chair is this long chair, which you in def you identify immediately, Olin. That is the statement that he's trying to make. Because when you walk in, that chair is different than everything else. This looks a little bit more like a throne. 
everything else looks quite minimalistic, but the high end back of this chair would indicate this is a Romulan in a position of power and influence. It's not decorated in any particular way. It's just subtle enough and noticeable enough where you can see, ah, there it is. He rises out of the chair and says, Ambassador Olin Majanil, it's a pleasure to see you. Ambassador Pagino? Please, please make yourself comfortable. I'm glad that we're finally getting an opportunity to speak. Indeed, it's been uh, quite some time coming. <clears throat> so, things ended well with Mendak, I hear? As well as can be expected given the circumstances, yes. Good, good. His return to the Romulan Star Empire is good, <laughs> quite good, a healthy thing. Now there's a voice of opposition in the Senate. He carries a lot of influence. Sila is not finding it quite as easy as she thought she would. Indeed. Though uh, it could have ended much more poorly than it did. Yes. And he lets yes. that hang in the air. Strategically lets that hang in the air for a moment and says nothing. It is good that the circumstances worked out as they did, though it is unfortunate that they escalated to that point in the first place. I suppose it couldn't be helped. The man was looking for his son. He had clearly lost his level-headed nature. It was very unusual to see him act that way, but I suppose after everything that's happened, especially after the Dominion War, it's important to keep your family close. We've all lost so much. Ambassador Pagino, I must admit that I am a little bit at a loss with you. At a loss? With me? How can I help you? It is very difficult to determine what your motivations are. When we spoke about Admiral Mendak, you heavily implied that he was an enemy of the state. And a... Uh... Oh, what's the word? A renegade. Perhaps that was true at the time, but the way that you spoke about him and the implications that you gave me put us in a very complicated position. Ambassador, implications? I spoke the truth. He was a man that did not have leave to take the vessel that he took to seek out his son. And at the time, he was not acting on behalf of the Romulan Star Empire. Is there another word for that, if not renegade? No, but I do wonder what it is that you expected us to do. I didn't have an expectation. I thought I might be helping you. Is that something I should avoid doing in the future? I must say, Ambassador, as much as you say you're at a loss with me, I'm surprised to hear this from you. I, I thought that this perhaps would have brought us closer. You would have seen that I'm somebody that you could trust. In the past few weeks, I have had to experience quite the bit of doublespeak from several Romulans. <laughs> and to question their motivations across the board. And though I believe that it is unfair to paint you all with the same brush that most people would tend to paint Romulans as deceitful and distrustful and manipulative. From the beginning, from the very first day that I met you, I have been doing my very level best to give you the benefit of the doubt because from what I've seen of your record, you are a man who wants nothing more than to see the Romulan Empire 
brought back to its former glory, not in the way of taking over other planets, not in the way of imperial conquest, but of actual, actual, uh, oh gosh, sorry, a uh, na actual initiatives on of peace, which I respect deeply. But the problem is, if you will allow me to continue, that it is very difficult to ascertain how sincere those are, how much of what you're doing is for the Romulan Empire, and how much of it you are doing for your own glory. And while I understand that there is a certain amount of pride that can be claimed for being at the forefront of some of the initiatives that you have voted for. I am hesitant by your, uh, I am made hesitant by your overall demeanor. And when you called for this meeting and implied that you wanted to speak with me for a specific reason, I have to say, I was concerned that there was a threat behind your door and not a friend. I appear to have misjudged you. I'm sad to hear this. Well, I suppose that'll conclude our business then, Ambassador. Thank you for stopping by. And he rises from his desk. Good day. And Ambassador Olin also stands. Okay. Was there something else? Surely I've given you plenty of time to level all of the insults you meant to throw at me before leaving today? There is something that I wish for you to understand before I go. Please. What I want more than anything is for you to achieve all that you stand for. I've read your file, and I know what you've voted on, and I know what you have led the charge on, and I believe in what you stand for, if it is truly what you stand for. I don't like being the person who has to second guess themselves on who they choose to trust. In fact, I hate it, and I don't like being in this position Offering a hand to you in peace is what I wish to do more than anything else, but I am currently in a position where I have been forced to rethink everything that I used to believe, and it is uncomfortable, and it is unfortunate. But I do want you to know that I do get wish to come back to a place where you and I can sit across a desk from each other and speak plainly without it being taken as insult. I told you what I told you today, not because I wished to hurt your feelings, but so that I could be honest about where I currently stand so that the next time we come to a table together, you will have full understanding of where I am because I do not think this will be the last time that you and I are required to speak in this capacity. I will not pretend to understand why it is that you came in here today and insulted my people, insulted me, 
hinted that somehow my motivations were insincere or that somehow I meant you harm after everything I've done. Not just in helping you with Mindak, but of course transmitting blueprints that I believe were leading to the successful capture of a very dangerous entity that had no business being on the side of the quadrant. After everything that I've done in order to better our friendship, to hear you speak to me as if I was some Ferengi trader who was trying to swindle you on a deal, and to go so far as to level borderline racist comments towards the Romulan people. Ambassador, I don't know exactly what they teach you at the United Federation's diplomatic corps, but I will not have it in this office. And if you ever want to approach me in friendship again, I'll have an apology from you first. Now, good day. Good day, Owen, Ambassador. Yes? As sharp as his words have been, he is holding something back. Your empathy tells you verbally, he just slashed you apart. But underneath it, you got somewhere good today. You struck something close. You don't know what it was, but you can sense it in the back, buried deep under that Romulan control, that something you said to him was disarming. But now you're watching a master class and how you and watching somebody pretend like you were the offender here. You're watching that flip and it's quite a sight to see. But if you weren't an empath, this would have gone very differently, but you can sense it. Whatever you said to him just now in this meeting, you pressed a button for sure. As a as a black queer person, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never <laughs> experienced that from a person ever in my life. <laughs> So uh, Olin kind of just nods. Good day, Ambassador Gino. As you stride out of the office, uh, the envoy that's waiting for you outside just bows to you very respectfully, and you walk out. You're now standing outside the Romulan Embassy and the chaos of Narendra Station moving about you. It reminds you again, Olin, that your job outside the bridge of a starship and outside the conversations that happen about science, there is a power coursing through Narendra Station that exists strictly on the diplomatic level where words can build or destroy empires. And there's a part of you that realizes uh, whether or not this is going to overflow into a full-on intrigue, you definitely are aware that after that encounter, you're in the game now. Paul's going to lose his shit when I tell him about this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, Owen is going to actually go in search of the captain. Okay. Um, you do a computer location of Captain Azri Sol. Captain Azri Sol is on Holodeck 1 on board the USS Ross. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's new. <laughs> And I guess I'll go pick up patience. <laughs> okay. All right. So you move uh, towards the main transporter room. Um, <clears throat> now, because I'm going to get to you in just a second, Captain Saul, but I'd really like to know two things before we get back to you as well, Chief Tech. I'd really like to know what McCrell is doing. Because, Bonnie, you've been a flurry of messages tonight of things that McCrell is up to. And I'd like to find out what is McCrell doing with the information that she's been given? What's going on in her medical bay? What are you? What is she doing right now? Um, for her, it's, it's more of um, after receiving the message of, of, you know, with the nomination and everything. And, you know, I ended with... The whole like it's an honor just to be nominated um she basically keeps kind of repeating that to herself because she knows once um things happen like once you know everything from like the background check to like all the other things that they'll go through my record my credentials everything she will not win and she knows this and so um it, she's kind of like you know from the party the night before it was like such a high 
And now it's just kind of like, it, she already knows what the outcome will be. Oh no. So, okay. <laughs> so she's kind of uh, coming into accept acceptance with that. And it's kind of made her a little angry. So I think McCrell's going to take advantage of another holodeck if that's, if it's free, I'm not Unfortunately, sure. Unfortunately, the only holodeck that is operating right now is holodeck one. So you'd um, have to talk to tech if you wanted to get power to one of the other holodecks. No, I don't want to talk to tech. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, tech. <laughs> I don't want to take you away he from- can hear you, Bonnie. I don't want to take you away from your engineering and your testicles. I will. Uh, no, thank you. I'm good. Thank you. I've had, I've had some already. I think. Um, okay. Uh, I guess, McCrell. Uh, yeah, I guess she's unsettled. She'll probably go to Niantra Station and just walk around. Like she has, she's not going to sit still. Okay. You know, I really don't. For for McCrell, it's just all kind of an internal battle. She's probably just going to pace around the promenade. Maybe just try and find some kind of work she's just gonna not be able to stay still okay i don't really have uh i don't really have anything else for you okay <laughs> mccrell you find yourself wandering around the promenade of narendra station hmm. you're kind of aimless but this place is big enough that it's almost like walking a circuit around a track and field uh outdoor arena the way it's built is just it's so spacious and large that it's easy to move about and get lost in the crowd yes i look um, at my data pad and i see that i'm getting in my steps today so <laughs> yeah nice. um overhead is the constant like echoed noise of uh announcements taking place people being requested in like a transporter room repairs being done the the sounds of klingon speech being spoken uh you can hear like all of these things the, the station is alive with activity it always is at this hour and as you are walking you hit a wall <laughs> not really paying attention as you're looking down at the data pad you just bump right into a wall except it's not a wall it's a klingon woman ah oh. She stands there looking at you um, as you take a couple of steps back. She's, uh, I mean, it's not unusual. Most people stand taller than you. Um, she is, of course, about six feet tall. She's leaning down looking at you, looks at the data pad as she quirks her head to the side. This is, of course, commended Naria. And she looks down at the data pad and says, you sent me a message. Yes. I uh, was just checking in to see if things were a little less boring around here. And I can see that that is not the case. No, they're still boring. Yes. The only thing that's different now is there's Romulans on the station, and I'm going to be expected to doctor them if they ever get injured, which they will because they're around a bunch of Klingons that want to kill them. Well, as someone who has very recently doctored the Romulan, it's not as bad as you would think. Oh, yes, it is. Well, depends on the Romulan. No, it doesn't. We will agree to disagree. Yes, we will. Well? She stares at you and says, Well, what? You messaged me. What do you want? Yes, I wanted to see if you were doing all right. I didn't really have much conversation besides that. Uh, Let's get a drink then. I would like that. We could catch up. I don't think you have much in, in exciting stories to tell, but I have quite a few if you'd like to hear. Any stories of battle, by chance? A bit. I will buy. Yes, you will. Ten minutes later, you're sitting at the table and sitting across from her and she's listening to you tell what story are you telling what have you told her uh i'm going to tell her about um nothing too i was gonna say how deep in the you go. yeah i'm gonna <laughs> tell oh, i can't tell her punch a chain is that's that's confidential well, the captain said I could do it, so I'm going to tell her. The captain said no, I could do it. Sam's like birthday. a fake friend told you. No, okay. I'm going to tell. Uh, I'm going to say that. Uh, just talk about like some of the the new discoveries that we've made. Uh, that's okay. common knowledge. Um, I will say. Um, 
I won't go into details, but I said I had to do a very extensive brain surgery. I won't say who, where, what, how. I'm not going into details. I'm just gonna, every time she asks, I'll just be like, it's confidential. Um, or read, you can read my paper when it's published. I'll send her my paper, is what I'll do. Okay. Um, so she can read the more stuff like that. But we'll go into little things like that. And then no I'm all- battle. She to- just leans in, nothing. Battle of the mind. Literally. Oh. But I do have a few holodeck programs that might interest you that I can transfer over. It helps me to blow off some steam. So I'll, I'll just, I can send her those and like. Okay. Those are like files, right? Like, as well, but I can airdrop them. <laughs> that's a bigger transfer of, uh, right, like, not on our data pad. I'll send it to her. Yeah. Okay. Um, she sees what you're g- planning on sending, and she goes, What's your story, anyway? Once upon a time. And then we have to fade away to the <laughs> scene. <laughs> <laughs> and we start telling her, basically, like, <laughs> my- okay. She will be the only person who knows my full life story ever. <laughs> uh, Captain on the holodeck, uh, what does Olin see when they enter the holodeck? Let's see. Uh, so, having not really uh, too many programs of their own, was kind of curious. Is there like a Spotify playlist style like trending of programs? There is, in fact, yes. The Ox Crew keeps a list of like preferred shared uh, simulations that are available. And these are things like walks on the beach or like zero G training, stuff like that. All right, let's see. Uh, Arbitrarily, number three on that list. Okay. <laughs> scroll it down and select number three. Yeah, not the first most popular one, not, nor the second. Those are probably going to be the like perma popular ones. Like those are the same ones that you see on number two, one and two of like the all time top 50. Uh huh. No, three is what's actually trending. So when you activate three, as you depress the screen and, and the computer begins to load it up, you catch a glimpse as to what it is you've selected. It is, in fact, a requested program from Solon. And the person who built this program is actually Commander Exio, who, as you recall, is an expert in, in holographic manipulation and building holographic programs. And what appears around you immediately is a bathhouse on the edge of an asteroid in the middle of deep space. It has no actual, um, it has no actual walls, but there are certain curtains that are still hanging in almost the zero G surrounding this tiled floor that blends effortlessly into the porous gray rock that is this asteroid. This asteroid seems to be orbiting what looks like a binary star system of both blue and red suns. And you see this large bath that's filled with steaming water and no servants, no nothing. It is just a simple program with a stunningly accurate recreated view. So you see Sol splayed like a lizard on the rocks on the warm tile next to the bath. Uh, There's some fairly soft music playing uh probably earth classical actually um and uh like like a sati or a debussy kind of vibe um chill yeah. and uh are, are they are they like have they de- disrobed yeah it's okay a, cool. it's, a, just, it's a bathhouse um just sure well absolutely good check um yeah. So, uh, congratulations. 
No, I think at this point the whole bridge is aware of Orion cultural tattoos because that harness went everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's um, let's say there's eucalyptus and peppermint and tea tree in in the air is the smell. So like your sinuses are open. Congratulations. And also the the heat, like the this mist that seems to collect around bathhouses, does not wander far from the area of the bath itself. So it does create this like foggy atmosphere that's drifting over the surface of this asteroid that glides through space. Oh. <clears throat> what is it? No. Oh. Can Captain? I help you? Oh, uh, no. no, it's, it's, you're fine. Actually, Thank uh, you. Mm -hmm. I help? <laughs> uh, well, actually, I guess since I here, do you mind if I join you? Please, I, did you actually bring patience? You mentioned earlier. Uh, I did, but the moment I walk into the bathhouse, I'm like, might be too warm for her. <laughs> might just be a computer fork off an additional simulation room off of the left exit. May we utilize uh, Mojinil Alpha 6? <laughs> a simple wall appears where there was none with an exit doorway that like, leads off into a separate room. Sure, sure she wouldn't mind the room to run around. <laughs> Come here! This way, this way, this way, this way! Patience picks up, of course, hearing the high-pitched sounds of Azari, like, calling out to her, gets thrilled, and follows the lead. And just through the All door. Right. Dog is in comfort and not dying of humidity. Yeah. And now, uh, Olin, will, Olin will similarly disrobe and uh, will actually get into the bath. I think at this okay. stage, for the purposes of being up, like, this feels like an upright conversation. Uh, so, so we'll do likewise. Okay. The two of you find yourselves essentially slipping into a, a, a holodeck program of Solon's design, created by, if you will, commissioned um, to, built, built by uh, Exio. So it takes just a few moments to not only start to appreciate the aesthetic of this place, but the temperature and the relaxation surrounded by the awesome image of the celestial sky. It leaves everyone feeling with a sense of awe as well as relaxation at the same time. This is this being the third most popular program. The other two must be either absurdities or uh, they must be mind blowing because this is quite extraordinary. As the two of you begin to feel tension, begin to bleed out of your body, just right out of your skin through the muscles and into the warm waters. I have a uh, good news and bad news. Mm. Yes. What is the good news? Start with the good news, please. That sounds wonderful. Well, that could be subjective. Depends on which you uh, consider to be good news at this point. Then I have no way of picking which one should come first, so you should probably just tell me one. I spoke to Ambassador Pagino. Mm -hmm. I was as upfront with him as I could be. How'd that go over? He accused me of being racist. So like the lead balloon, one would anticipate. This was the good news part. <laughs> the good news is he's full of shit. And I got him. I don't know what I've got yet, but I've got him. What did you get? He's hiding something. I'm not sure what, but, and I'm not entirely sure what it is that I said that pinged it. But I could feel it. Somewhere underneath that facade, there's a lie waiting to be uncovered. Sol dunks 
three seconds. Comes back up. Most of us have something rather like that. How do you plan on extracting it then? I think that's probably going to take a little bit of time. Like I said, I'm not entirely sure what it is that I said that got him. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of sifting. Hmm. Keep poking at him, I guess. Every opportunity I get, Captain. I don't envy your job. And I am afraid that as of right now, I'm not entirely sure I envy yours. Because here's the I... potential bad news. I know Dump. you just... Just the face. What? <laughs> Ambassador Jahl has asked for a favor that requires your particular set of skills. What? <laughs> he has reason to believe that General Cargan is in league with the House of Duras. And he needs proof. It's very possible that he's also in league with Sila. Now, Captain, being a former member of the intelligence community, you know all about the House of Doros. You know all about their history with the Romulan Star Empire. You know about their history with Sila. They have a very specific history with Sila. They supposedly or a disenfranchised house. It's surprising to hear the name Duras after all this time. But then again, the Dominion Moor may have afforded opportunities to a fallen house to reclaim some semblance of glory. Whatever the cause, hearing that name again causes your skin to crawl just a little bit. Hmm. Ambassador Jal is doing everything he can right now on the render station to keep the peace. General Cargan is doing everything that he can to stir up a war. General Cargan just needs proof. And he asked me to see if I knew anybody with an expertise in espionage knowing full well it was you. Sol gets up. Okay. Gets out of the bath. All right. Walks over to the cold bath. Okay. Steps in. <laughs> Frigid water immediately this this shock to your system as you step in. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Trust me, the moment he said the words, I wanted to throw myself out of the nearest airlock. Well, that would have been overdoing it, I think. <laughs> Even so, I know you want to get back out there as much as I do. At least I hope you do. Well, and I wanted to get away from this. And I thought I finally had. And then we were dragged back into it because of my past, and then I thought I got away from it. And then we had to take Sorax. And then I thought, really? Gotten away from it. Do you want me to ask Sorax instead? You don't have to do this, and you're not the only one with the ability to do it. And besides, it would give him something to do and give you the chance to try to extricate yourself from it if that's what you really want. Sorex is our crew now, which means he's under my command, which means it is in my power to do for him what others can't do for me. 
he has a chance to finally be done with it and stay done. I grab and when, and when, Captain, do you get to be done? Captain's job is never done, I suppose. And a spies? I won't end the program. It'd probably chill you too much. So, enjoy. Captain. <laughs> doorway. You're out? No, no, no. Doorway, pause. Oh, okay. You, know. you call for the arch. It appears right in front of you. Yes. If there is another way, I'm going to find it. If there was another way, you wouldn't have come to me. I'm sorry. It's my duty. Bye, patience. Mm. I don't know. All right. <laughs> Cutscene back to the bar. McCrell's like, then I turned four years old. It was a cold winter. Right now, just like, Klingon <laughs> is like, she's looking at you with her mouth kind of agape, just going, <gasps> Do you heal people or kill them? Depends on who you ask. <laughs> uh huh. I'd heard rumors that you were engaged in some fight. No one knows what. Did you fight something recently? I heard the USS Ross had some action at some point. Yes. Is that true? You can call it some action, and let's say that there was a fight, and it was very short. <laughs> Adapting to life after the Dominion War is not easy. I miss battle wounds. I miss stories of war, of triumph of victory of dying well <laughs> one never actually leaves the battle it's always there yes i suppose it is as you say this with a somber tone you see this glint oh. of joy in her eyes as she nods fondly and kind of looks we off. have the opposite way of, th of expressing yeah. that <laughs> carrying the weight of war on your back and she's like hell yeah like <laughs> clearly Klingon psychology, obviously, completely different from a lot of this, a lot of the way you grew up, the way people are presented. Um, she just nods fondly as, as you say this. Um, back aboard the USS Ross, in the engine room, you are just now finishing the latest hour of passage as y'all are trying to organize all of these engineering teams. Mm. Um, your gifts have been removed. Good. <laughs> um, but you were on, we'll say this is hour number four now. Um, of all the planning and getting the equipment loaded up, um, tomorrow is going to be the day where you guys start preliminary works of like surveying what needs to be taken apart and then assigning every team to where it needs to be and getting on the right comm channels, like everything. It's, it is, you're turning this into a well-oiled machine mm -hmm. and you're starting to get a bit of what the thrill might be like tech, how exciting it might be to actually build a ship. Mm -hmm. This, there's a part of you though, that as a chief engineer, they're not going to get to experience it because you're going to get to install this thing and then you're going to get to use it. That's not something a shipbuilder necessarily gets to experience. You're getting to actually build the thing and then drive it. That is a whole level of satisfaction that people who sit back and build the ships don't necessarily always get to experience. Mm -hmm. And there is this rising excitement because this is the most complicated, largest job you have ever been given. Yeah. You've never had to do a full restructure of the inside of a sensor suite on, a, on an experimental class starship that's the same scale as a galaxy and sovereign class. So this is a big undertaking. Um, you are currently, uh, right now, a bunch of the teams have departed and are currently being shown their assigned stations and where they're going to be located in the main saucer section and where they're going to be located down near the, the main sensor core. 
Um, there's also teams being assigned to the deflector dish and to monitor systems down there as the deflector dish occasionally interacts with the sensor suite um, through some unorthodox in, uh, unorthodox solutions that are sometimes sought by the crews of the ships. So that's being kept track of. Um, as all of this is happening, you glance up just in time to see uh, Asmi Shanto rounding the corner of main engineering. And from the look on her face, the data pad that she's holding, the look on her face immediately causes you to have a sensation of, oh no. Yeoman, is everything all right? She approaches and says, yes, chief. Um, sorry, I have a message uh, that just came in priority from Starfleet. It's addressed to you. Oh, well, I'll take it right away. And Xander? Yeah. The message that I'm cutting and pasting okay. in our chat uh -huh. is the message you receive. Okay. So you hold up the data pad. Wow. Okay. Um, this is a lot. Uh, so, uh, I will take this in my office then. Uh, thank you, Yeoman. You're welcome, sir. And anything you need, sir. Tech has sort of gotten this like tunnel vision and will head into his sort of office within engineering. Sure. You don't even respond to her. You just walk right yeah. past her and yeah. she watches you go. Um, tech, you move down the corridor towards the small office that you have where you have your consoles um, and you slide into the chair. This is Chief Tech to Dr. McCrell. Can you meet me in my office in engineering, please? You're muted, Bonnie. <laughs> Do I, I get that online just racing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the middle of the conversation with this Klingon, who at this point is doing a very human, uh, like, kind of looking at you like... And then I turned 11. And, and then you hear the chirping sound. Uh, yes, Chief, I'll be right there. I'm uh, on the interstation, but it shouldn't take me long. I'm getting you drunk next time we talk. And she uh, stands up. Cajuns can't drink alcohol. Mm. She, you don't know if that's a smile or a sneer on a Klingon, but she just goes and leaves, <laughs> taking her cup with her. <laughs> She's allergic, or allergic to alcohol. <laughs> Fun um, okay, unless there's anything else, we can cut to the scene. I think you. that I... date went well. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a date? I'm not bad at this. <laughs> <laughs> um. Unless there's anything else, we can cut to you arriving on the USS Ross, beaming yes. over there in the last, the currently the only functioning in uh, transporter room, which right now is no longer transporter room one. It's actually uh, transporter room six on deck 28. So you have to, uh, as you beam in, you're actually closer to engineering than you normally would be. You make your way down to main engineering on deck 32. Moving in through the area, this place is heavily crowded. You can see a lot of the engineering teams, people in white coats, but you see a lot of yellow shirts moving through here, um, nodding to you, a couple of people greeting you. Doctor, a little people kind of surprised to see you. Um, eventually you round the corner, move out of main engineering, down the corridor to where Tech has his main office area. And as you enter, you see, of course, the schematic of the USS Ross in its current state and all the power fluctuation systems, everything, much like the wall in Data's office, how it had this constantly functioning monitored uh, operations wall and tech sitting at the desk what does she see when she walks in you can see the lights of the displays just dancing across his face as he is gaunt and looks up to you with these hollow eyes and says they found they found remains of reiku and um it's on kartas 4 and they want to know what i want to do with them and i i don't know what his ending was life it was like i don't know what happened and you do it says um it says they recovered the remains on the planet caritas 4 when he was killed in action during his shuttle evacuation i don't know anything about that i don't know what he was trying to do i don't know what choice to make here Doctor, 
I need your help. On the file to Starfleet about your brother, I told them that he was leaving on my orders to go and get help, more supplies, more medical personnel. We had found on that planet a camp, mostly made up of women and children that were from Cardassia, that were injured, sick. They needed help. Um, you see McCrell really struggling. Um, Riku, would help would have Riku would have helped them. He was going to get help and more supplies. And the shuttle was destroyed. I stayed back with the women and children. Uh, I'm going to spend mm. threat. Okay. I'm going to ask you, oh. Chief Tech, to make an insight command check. Okay. <laughs> and McCrell. Yes. I'm going to ask you mm -hmm. to make a presence command check. Oh, God. Difficulty is one. Sure it is. Bonnie, we heard that holler through Sanders' mic. <laughs> what? No. Uh, we were muted. Um, one success. Also one success. What happens? Ah. Uh, we have to die. We have to fight to death. Um. Ty goes to the active. That's correct. McCrell hmm. tells you this. You've known McCrell a long time. You know her demeanor. You know when she's talking to patients. You know when she's trying to calm people. McCrell is lying to you. She is absolutely lying to you right now. And you can see it in her eyes. Some, she is not telling you something. And you can see what makes this even harder to hear and to identify this lie is how hard she is trying to make sure you don't see it. She is trying so hard to play straight doctor right now and just deliver to you news that you'll accept and move on from. But you know her too well after all this time. That's not how it happened. That's where we have to stop. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I am mean, so sorry. It's nine thirty-four. Yeah. Look, there's no Borg in a box. I feel like we're still winning here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Borg in a box. No. A Borg in a box. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, half. Glass half full to Lev. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you for these gifts tonight, everybody. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, man, we really pushed it. But yeah, we ran up against the line. Um, well, it's finally happened. Wow. This is a good session, y'all. Lots of stuff happening right now with every character. A new story arc for pretty much every character starting to develop right now in front of our very eyes. It's really exciting. And um, also, like, growth and inflection points and, like, people mm -hmm. get into a thing and, like... Yeah. Okay. This is about where we experienced it in Shield of Tomorrow, too. I've noticed that we, we hit, like the episode, like we had started already getting a lot of momentum in the teens, but when we were hitting episodes like 20 to 30, that's when we were really just like jiving on what was going on. And like, everybody knew their characters. They knew each other, they knew other characters. Like we've, we've hit that real good point where like really juicy story is really starting to pop here with everybody. I just want to congratulate everyone. Some great RP tonight, like some difficult RP, some great RP. I want to give 
particular kudos because of all of you, as amazing and as emotionally vulnerable as you were, you did not have to endure lifting four pound testicles at a Ferengi's shop. So I just want to give my hat <laughs> off to Ravity. Well done. And not my a God. single time did anyone call it a, the the bag that she carried the, them in a ball, ball sack. Right, not, not until not now. We made it the whole show. Yeah. Not, not once. Not not once. Absolutely spectacular. Well done. Well done. This, um, this part doesn't count. <laughs> Yeah, definitely not. I didn't break the streak just now. <laughs> Good point, Bonnie. Nicely done. All right. <laughs> this was a great session tonight, you guys. I cannot wait to see what happens on the next episodes of Clear Skies. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this week, we are filming our one shot with B. Dave, the vampire one shot. And I'm very excited to talk to you all about that, especially because if you've been following my streams, you've been hearing me talk so much about my character. And as of tonight, that character has completely changed because <laughs> that shit happens when good ideas get dropped in chat and then all of a sudden we're off to the races with some great shit so um, it was his idea it was it, I, <laughs> hey, you inspired it because everyone kept dropping the same thing over and over all right so I'll, that's all i'm gonna say but um more information will be coming about that one shot coming out soon and of course we have our predation game coming up secrets of silver creek is this saturday so stay tuned for that um ox crew thank you all so much as always for being with us and going with us on the journey we will see you next time one Until more then. thing before we go. Wait, one what? more thing. I what? just because it was a very emotional episode and I just yes. have to get this off my chest really quick. Yeah. Happy birthday, Sam! Happy birthday, yeah. Sam! Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Thank you. Hey Link Frequencies closed.